Wales uh, Education, Children and Families Policy Committee. The meeting today is open to the public. The meeting will be webcast and the recording will also be available to people to, for people to view later through the Council's website. It is also possible that Sheffield Live TV will record and rebroadcast this meeting. Please can I request that mobile telephones and other such equipment are switched to silent mode so that not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There is no fire test planned for today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from the council town hall staff and the assembly point is in Tudor Square. The agenda and reports for today's meeting are available on the council's website and paper copies are available at the meeting and there is one, uh, one agenda reports pack. We have received a number of public questions. During the public questions and petition section of the meeting, I will invite the lead questioner to ask their questions. And I ask for each policy committee member in turn to introduce themselves. Uh, Councillor Hussain. Councillor Tali Hussain for Benbury Road and member of this committee. Uh, Councillor Sean Edmire Richards, ma uh, <coughs> member for Manor Ward, uh, substituting for Jane Dunn. Councillor uh, Nika Bushera from Netherridge and Cheryl Ward. Councillor Ian Horner from, from Baton Ward. This is my first uh, education meeting. Uh, Councillor Mohamed Marouf, uh, Grace Park Ward, and uh, the Lib Dem spokesperson for education, families, and children. Councillor Anne Wishaka for West Ecclesfield Ward. Paul Turpin, Green Councillor for Glebus Valley Ward, and I'm a substitute member for Marouf Rove today. Malaka Hewi, Councillor for Brumhill and Charvel Ward. Thank you. And in response to uh, Ian's uh, suggestion, it's his first meeting. I think there are only myself and Anne that are still on this committee from last year. So it's everyone's first committee of education, children and families. You were substituted last year, but welcome to everyone um, to, to this, this committee. Thank you. Uh, at this point, item one on the agenda is apologies for absence. And Fiona, do we have any apologies, please? We do, yes. We have received apologies from Councillor Maru Roof and um, Councillor Jane Dunn. Thank you. Uh, there are no uh, reported items on the agenda of, that relate to exclusions of the public and press. Uh, item three on the agenda is de uh, declarations of interest. Are there any members that wish to declare an interest in any of the terms of business on the agenda? Councillor. Just a point of uh, clarification, uh, uh, Councillor Dale. If you're a governor in uh, any of the schools, is that a declarable interest? It wasn't before, but I thought just clarify for completeness. Thank you. Thank you. Item number four uh, on the agenda is minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, this is on page 11 of the agenda uh, pack. I think there's only myself and uh, Anne that would be able to declare whether or not these were a true record of the previous meeting. And I have identified one error on the uh, minutes and that would be item number 8.1. The response to 8.1 is the response to 7. Um, so the actual action of that meeting was the office has requested a deferral and the committee agreed that to be brought today. Thank you. If we can just make that amendment. Thank you. Other than that, Anne, do you declare that these were true record apart from that? Thank you. Item number five, just before uh, we consider amendments to the urgency subcommittee, I need to inform members that the following changes have been made since the meeting of the, uh, on the, of the 17th of May as follows. Councillors Jane Dunn and Talib Hussain replace councillors Mike Drabble and Aptazan Mohammed, and councillor Mike Drabble is appointed as substitute member of the committee, all with effect from the 30th of May. Sarah, item number five, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yes, following those amendments to the membership of the committee uh, made <coughs> on behalf of the full council, um, this committee is now being asked to um, look at the urgency subcommittee. Um, there was a vacancy following the meeting of the um, 17th of May, 
Um, so item one asks you to agree the appointment to that vacancy of Councillor Jane Dunn. Um, and we, we're also asking that you um, grant authority to the monitoring officer in a uh, case of urgency to appoint um, members to the urgency subcommittee so that if there isn't a meeting of this committee in time, uh, that those vacancies that have arisen can still be appointed to. So that's what the items on agenda item five relate to. Do any members have any questions on agenda item number five? Uh, Councillor Turpin. Thank you. Um, just uh, speaking as the substitute member, uh, is uh, Maruf a named member of this committee? Because obviously I, he's not here, so he is. I don't need to speak on his behalf for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So in light of the um, information that has just been given to us, does uh, anyone have, uh, is everyone in agreement uh, with agenda item number five? Take silence as agreement. Thank you. Item number six is public questions and petitions. Um, if I could ask our um, questioner, is it Fatima Salim, uh, to come to the microphone to ask uh, your questions? You can, you can. You don't have to come alone. If you'd like someone to come with you, that's perfectly fine. So do I ask all the questions, by the way? Okay. Yeah, uh, the, the, the process at the moment has been agreed that you would ask questions on behalf of everyone. If you want to go through each individual question and then I can follow with an answer, is that okay? So one question at a time. So, or, or are you all wanting to come and ask your own individual questions? I would like to believe that you would be asking all of the questions on behalf of everyone. Um, so to you. Okay. I have a few people that want to ask their own question and then are, are I can they, ask the rest. Are they the written questions, yeah? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yep. Oh, so the first question is, those who know racism happens behind the scenes, do nothing or defend their position knowing um, that they're wrong, or just as complicit as the perpetrators. If this type of matter comes to the public arena, we want to know if the politicians will apologize, whether staff will be held to account, or will this be brushed under the carpet? Thank you. I'll answer that question now. So the recent Race Equality Commission in Sheffield had concluded that racism and racial disparities remain significant in the lives of Sheffield citizens. Sheffield City Council is committed to ensuring that positive action is taken to address these issues and we are committed to becoming an anti-racist city. We are working hard to ensure that we collect data and have measurable targets to monitor and oversee both how we deliver our services in the community and to people of colour, but also how we look to employ people from our diverse communities. We are also a learning organisation that looks to educate and develop our leaders and learn from both good and bad experiences. And where people believe they have been aggrieved, we will apologize when we get things wrong and we will look to learn and work in collaboration to get things right. We are looking over the next year to work with schools and multi-agency trusts in partnership with Learn Sheffield to increase diversity on governing bodies to represent the communities and pupils they serve and also to focus on equality, diversity and inclusion and to play their part in ensuring Sheffield is an anti-racist city. We encourage all schools to ensure that there is a culture where racism can be reported and that it is thoroughly investigated and appropriate actions taken. This council is committed to working with schools to ensure racism is challenged and inclusivity is at the heart of education across the city. I think, in short, the answer to your question is we will apologise when we get things wrong and we will look and learn at the work to collaborate to make things better. Thank you. Can Sarah come and ask her a question? Uh, 
Um, so everyone knows that people of colour have to work twice, if not three times as hard, just to be recognised if they want to be in leadership positions. Could you tell us how you are supporting current POC in leadership positions and how you will ensure that they will always have a fair chance at leadership so that young BAME students can have achievable aspirations? Thank you, Sarah. So, again, referring back to the Race Equality Commission in June 2022, it stated that perceptions of bias emerge as a factor in how professionals across sectors experience their working life. There is a commitment that Sheffield, again, will be an anti-racist city. Over the next academic year, Sheffield City Council will continue to work to ensure that there are equal opportunities in progress into leadership roles. And we will actively engage with people of colour in leadership roles are, or aspiring to be leaders to understand barriers and together find solutions. Sheffield City Council, will re will re with regard to the Family and Children's Committee, together find, uh, will, gain, will again share the Race Equality Commission findings with all education institutions and childcare providers in the city and work with them to look at how we ensure that all employees have equal access to opportunities for leadership roles. Thank you. My question is, how many teachers of colour do you have in Sheffield? What support and safe space have they been given? And if not, why? Thank you. So the council does not hold the number of head teachers of colour, that information across the city. Each individual school, whether local authority or academy, maintains its own records and information as they are the employer. The council also looks to provide support where requested by the school as an employer. Schools, however, provide their own pastoral support for their employees and have their own HR facilities. We have, however, recognised that this is possibly an area for development and will work with our education institutions and leaders over the coming year to identify the issues and work collectively, including with employees and leaders of colour to find better solutions. Thank you. I know you said the council doesn't disclose it, but I know there's four head teachers that are people of colour, and I know they're not treated as equal as the white head teachers. So what has the head of education and the councillors done to protect those head teachers and to address that situation? Thank you. So leading on to the next question, um, which is what you're asking, the council is committed to lead on becoming, again, an anti-racist city. We value all of our head teachers who work across the city in both local authority, maintained schools and academic academies. Head teachers are employed by school organisations and it's not that we don't disclose that information. The council itself as a body doesn't hold that information as schools are independent employers. So head teachers are employed by their school organisations and as such are provided support by their chair of governors and governing bodies or trust. The question suggests that more can be done to support head teachers who are people of colour and that we can't, we will not disagree on. The new strategic director for children's services, uh, who's to my left, has offered an open invitation to speak to leaders and head teachers of colour over the, her first few weeks and will prioritise this to understand barriers and issues that are faced by these valued leaders in our city who role model possibilities and opportunities for our children. But what do you do to protect them now? Well, that, that was the response to your question. We don't feel that enough is being done. So, so not enough has been done to protect them, but why? I'll turn to Meredith for that. Sorry, I'm, I'm also um, new to this. Um, so 
schools, so within the, um, within the city, schools have responsibilities for their employees. It's not the council, it is schools. So it's a different world than it was um, a number of years ago where local authorities had responsibility for teachers and head teachers in schools. Um, I think that quite clearly from the questions and from what you're saying and the, the question back is, we're not, you don't feel that we're doing enough and um, other people that you're representing don't feel that we're doing enough. So what I'm saying is, look, we, at the moment we are um, looking to um, chairs of governors um, to um, provide that support. Um, we need to be in that space more, so I'm happy to have that conversation and work out how we do it better. So um, I, I, can't, you know, I can't go for what the past is. I've been in post for three days. I'm absolutely willing to um, and want to collaborate and find a, a better way through this. So the question that I have is, what are you doing to support women of colour in senior positions in schools? As with the previous answers, I don't think that it would give you the answer that you deserve at this point. So the answer that I have is, again, about Meredith offering an open door. I personally don't feel that enough is being done across Sheffield in any uh, arena to support women of colour into leadership roles, which is what was identified as part of the Race Equality Commission. There is a written answer that we can give to you, um, but I was a Race Equality Commissioner, and I absolutely agree with the Commission that there's a lot more work to be done. I can refer back to Meredith with regards to education. As Mer Meredith has explained, the education landscape is very different at the moment. So we've got maintained schools who are governed by their governors and multi-agency trusts who are governed by the trust. Meredith, would you like to come in on this? So um, we have a relationship um, with Learn Sheffield who also supports schools and they provide a range of different training. So um, there are things that are taking place across the city, but I think my reflection on coming in, and as I say, I have been here for three days, is that we're not doing enough and we're not prioritising uh, enough around this area. Um, and I want to do that differently um, and I want to collaborate um, with you to do that and also with committee so that we get the right actions, that we have a grip on that and then we're absolutely um, supporting um, women um, into, leadership through, uh, into leadership roles and particularly women of colour into leadership roles and actually supporting anybody of colour into leadership roles. Can I ask a question that they should introduce themselves you know, when they ask the question? Um, I'm going to ask the rest of the questions. So, um, We are aware that the, of the race commission that Sheffield has just had. Can you tell us how systemic racism in the, Sheff in the, Sh the Sheffield education system is being mo monitored? And do officers and people in power know what that actually looks like? Thank you. So Sheffield Council commissioned the report and are acting on its recommendations. There are specific actions overseen by this committee to ensure we work towards the anti-racist city and organisation. Senior leaders work hard to understand the concepts of implicit and explicit racism and unconscious bias, and look at to listen and co-produce solutions with people of colour and with other underrepresented groups in Sheffield. Senior leaders strive to actively promote equality, diversity and inclusion, we are committed through our action plan to collect accurate data of school governance, leadership teams, teaching and support staff, diversity for local authority maintained schools, further develop EDI resources, including guidance and training to support schools uh, and school staff, including racial literacy and cultural competency, to promote equality related awareness days across schools, to work with Learn Sheffield, as Meredith has alluded to, to keep the Race Equality Commission as an agenda item on governors 
CEOs briefings to share and collate information and best practice. Governor and staff recruitment are anonymised and governors are brought together after six months to share practice experiences, continue to support and develop opportunities for governors for black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. To su support for er the early years sector by convening regular meetings to address issues of race and EDI and signposting to agencies who can support that offer. Support a locality approach through our education localities. Develop a programme of inclusive engagement linked to the local population, starting with priority areas where we know improvements are needed. Supporting the early years sector through three twilight sessions, as well as carry out setting visits to support on a one-to-one -one basis. We deliver training, introduction to inclusive environments which support settings in creating a warm and welcoming environment within the early years profession. Mm -hmm. Whilst recruiting and retention in early years is a national issue, Sheffield is working with colleges and universities to encourage people into the workforce or to develop their skills further. To share good practice, we deliver citywide networking events and briefings as well as training opportunities. The council is committed again to working with people of colour and, is, and, and with lived experience to ensure that these are the right priorities for the coming year, to ensure we promote an anti-racist approach across all of our partnerships and educational institutions. You said you work with people of colour, but what people of colour do you work with in the education system? I don't think we're doing that well enough, um, which is why, um, you know, on my third day, um, uh, it is really... Um, it, it, it doesn't feel um, good that you're having to come here and, and hold us to account, but it's absolutely right that I now say, look, the door is open. Can I work with you? Can I work with um, uh, your, your colleagues and your partners so that we can get this right? I know you keep saying it's your third day, but like, don't you think it's low-key embarrassing that these young people are coming to ask you these questions? And you guys have all been in this, in, like, working for the education system for multiple years? Like... So, I'm, no, I'm not comfortable. I think it, I think it feels very uncomfortable. I think that um, uh, what, I'm, what we're saying throughout this is that there is a uh, apology that you feel that we're not doing enough. And my answer is, I, I've been three days in Sheffield, and I know I've said that four times now, but literally three days in Sheffield. For me, it's not good enough, and we need, I need to be engaging with you, and we, you need to be creating the priorities with us about how, as an organisation, um, and within children's services, we become an anti-racist uh, organisation, but also how we filter that to our schools and to our multi-academy trusts. If I, if I could just respond to that as well. I've, I've been being a race equality commissioner, like I've said previously, and campaigned against racism and any forms of equality for all of my adult life. I absolutely appreciate you bringing this today, pushing it up the agenda to ensure that everyone in this room actually listens to what you're saying. Because the, the commission has been commissioned and we have got recommendations we need to follow. Rightly so, you've brought this because it's not in the forefront enough and I don't feel that it is being dealt with enough. Have senior council officers and members had training to understand what racism can look like and if an allegation is made, is there a tactic to defend rather than address? So the second action of the Race Equality Commission was that organisations need to invest in education and developing leaders and employees. There is already training which is provided and over the next few months we will be reviewing this to ensure that it meets the requirements to become an anti-racist city. We're not clear whether or not the training that is currently being offered is the right training and is being delivered at the right time. We will also work with schools through Learn Sheffield to review current race equality training and ensure that it meets our objectives. Sorry, Chair, I'll come in at the end once they've asked the questions. Are you aware that POC teachers will have more allegations made against them than white teachers? How is this being monitored in Sheffield? Do you value people in leadership? And do you see this as a benefit to our young children? Thank you. The governing bodies are responsible for complaints made about their schools, both by pupils, parents and their employees. As a council, 
that is leading an anti-racist approach, we are committed to working with educational institutions to support their agenda. We value leaders and want to ensure that all communities in Sheffield are fairly represented and heard. This is essential on a number of levels and not least for our future generation, both their opportunities and the diversity they bring to the city. So the complaints that do come through schools go to the school and not directly to the council. But if the people, if the teachers that are people of colour are having more complaints than the white teachers, then don't you think that's your responsibility? So this is a really complex area. So schools, the responsibility for schools and complaints in schools are um, governing bodies um, and chairs of governors. So the, the, the Sheffield City Council doesn't have a, um, a direct leadership role with schools now. In the, in the system that works, schools, the people who govern schools are the school governing bodies. However, I do think that there is a space that we need to be taking as a city council which is understanding what those complaints are and looking to question and challenge when we are with schools and making sure that schools do have the right anti-racist approach. Mm -hmm. So, and in this role, the role that I play as Director of Children's Services is around negotiation and influence with schools. I don't have direct control over them. They are outside of the remit of the, the, the council. But as I say, I do think that there is a space that I should be in in, that, in this to make sure that the issues that you're raising are being looked at, are being addressed, and are high on the agenda. Like many industries, the education system in Sheffield is built on systemic and institutionalized racism. As it's your responsibility, what has the head of education and officers done to ensure diversity amongst teachers and specifically within leadership? Thank you. So what has been shared uh, with the Commission spans education, crime, justice and policing, sports, culture, health, business and employment, civic life and communities and more. The perpetuation of racism and racial disparities across sectors and major institutions in Sheffield compelled the Commission to restate the urgency to instigate positive measures and improvements in organisations and among its citizenry. We are committed to addressing these issues and looking to learn from lived experience. What I would add is that the one year action that has been delivered to move the organisation and city closer to becoming an anti-racist is being published imminently. This will have, this will and has included a focus by council officers when visiting schools and educational institutions to discuss the Race Equality Commission and possible implications. We have been reviewing the training package, as I stated before, for equality, diversity and inclusion, meeting with providers to discuss possibilities. We have shared good practice about equality awareness days in schools, which has been well received. And we have been working uh, with Learn Sheffield on raising the profile of the Race Equality Commission recommendations and priorities. We have far more work to do, as Meredith and I have stated, and we truly believe that in this area and will remain uh, review our actions and also progress over the coming months, working closely with members of the community and Education, Children and Families Policy Committee. This is the responsibility of all of us uh, in this committee, it, not just our officers. We all make a commitment as, as when we become elected members to ensure that the commission is actioned. We don't just want to have done a commission, ticked a box, popped it on a a shelf and it just to become a document it needs to be a working document and I would hope that from this meeting where you've brought this to us that Meredith and I and other members of this community uh, committee would like to meet with you in a workshop style environment where we you can explain to us if you've got any specific issues that you want to discuss that we can't discuss in this open arena we'd like to address those and I think that's that's where we're at at the moment. We have to do a lot more, and we're not in deni we're not denying that. But you keep talking in future tense, like we need to do more. We need to do more. But systemic and institutionalized racism has been around for decades, and I feel like the Sheffield education system hasn't improved in the last twenty years. And the fact that there's only four head teachers that are people of color, they're not even protected. They're not even respected as much as the white head teachers. 
And you can keep telling me you're going to protect them and you encourage diversity, but there's not even diversity in this room. I brought the diversity with me. And we have to come here to address it with you. You keep giving us these answers where you've just repeated yourself a billion times with the exact same policies that you want to do that you've probably said in a million other committee meetings. And I just feel like none of your words have value. And until I see action, which you're not doing right now, you've not done in the last previous months where two head teachers who are people of color have not been respected. And I don't know, I feel like no one respects what you guys are saying right now. The counselors, the head of education, everyone is, I don't think you've bettered Sheffield. And it's, it's like hard to like watch, it's hard to listen to you guys talk because if as people of color, if our, like education, it's about young people and all your answers, they were so like, like it just missed the human element. And if education is about education, young people, these are actual humans and their future is theirs. And you don't even respect their future enough to protect them. And if you're not protecting the teachers who are people of color, who had to work 10 billion times harder than any of you guys in the room, just because of their skin tone, just because of their race, their religion, their gender, if you're not protecting them, how are we expect? How are we supposed to feel protected? How are, bro, I brought my, <laughs> I brought my nephew who's three months old. How am I supposed to tell him he's going to be protected by you guys? There's no confidence in anything that you've done because you don't handle situations properly. And what are you doing to handle the situations like right now? I don't want to hear what you're going to do in the future. I know you've only worked three days, so maybe you don't answer. All the. <laughs> All the teachers in the past, I don't think you've protected. I could bring so many teachers who are people of color and they have horror stories. And it's because none of you guys in this room stepped up to protect them. And now we're not protected and now our future generation isn't protected. And I don't think you understand how important education is for us. So in response to some of your points, and I do, I do value you being here, I really do. You know, I have, I have personal experience of, of this. I might not look like I do, but I, I do. What I would say is, with regards to the teachers that you know that have had these bad experiences, it's really important that they, and I know it's difficult to, to, to raise that as a person of colour in an arena where you feel like you're not safe, to be able to raise that because you might fear that you're not going to be able to progress through your career or you might feel that it will have a, a negative impact on your career but I would hope to be able to create a safe space with myself and Meredith to be able to have those conversations not in the public arena with individuals to try and understand what's gone wrong and, and we, we can't go back and under, undo the mistakes that have been made the, the lack of learning the lack of progress I fully agree with what you're saying but what we can do from today is make arrangements, we'll get some dates where we can meet with yourselves and we can meet with the people that you're referring to and we can really start to embed the work. It is a commitment that is going to go on our work programme for this committee. We were only two years into the committee, we started last year and it wasn't on the work programme last year. It will be on the work programme this year. I would hope that you would come back regularly to committee meetings to challenge us on what we are doing to ensure that we are accountable like I said, the, the Race Equality Commission and the, like you're referring to, we're saying what we're going to do in future. This cannot just be a narrative. It has to be actioned. And I would hope that there's some commitment from people that have come today to be able to work with us and challenge us regularly at these meetings with regards to that. And that, that would be a commitment for me. And I'm sure from other committee members, uh, we have a few of us yesterday did meet and speak about this issue. We are open to that. We are open to public challenge and we would hope that we would be able to form a collaborative relationship so that we can start to push this forward. Okay. Do you guys have questions? Can they ask a question? Yeah, just one more. Thank you. Hi, um, so you've said that you encourage us to come and challenge you every time um, you have a meeting, but I don't think it's the res responsibility of people of colour to come and challenge you. It's your job, it's your role to 
be active in communities and find out these issues. I don't think it's fair that... Also, I'm not going to lie, many people have already challenged you and there's been no change. Mm -hmm. It's so, not our responsibility to challenge you. I think yeah. you need to do the work yourself, research yourself, see where the issues are. It's kind of embarrassing to see people in your position say it's um, the job of 18, 20 year olds to come and tell you what to do. It's not like, fair. We're protecting the people, the head teachers of, that are people of color. Why should we be protect, protecting them when you're the head of education? Isn't that like your job description? I think my offer may have been misconstrued. It absolutely is our responsibility, but we we want to ensure and have a relationship with you to make sure that we're doing it right. You know, we we are constantly as part of the Race Equality Commission. The narrative at the very, very beginning was hard to reach that communities. That is not a term which I can relate to. It's underserved, and I do reach out, and I'm sure many of my colleagues do reach out into our our communities, communities that we represent, and communities across Sheffield. To, to listen and to learn and so that we can develop different ways of working. We're not going to deny the fact that things are not good. And I just feel that, yes, it is our responsibility, but we need to have some form of dialogue with people to see, are we doing it right? Are you happy with, with the way we're going? The new way of working in the council is all about collaboration. It's all about delivering things with the citizens of Sheffield. It can't just be us in the room that are, we have the responsibility, the responsibility stops with us. That I, I completely agree with that. But anything we do has to be in collaboration with communities, not doing to communities, but doing with communities. So we have to have that relationship. I agree, it's not your responsibility. However, if you've got information if you've got experiences that you can share with us that can help us to be able to do this differently and better to achieve the goal that we want where we want to get to then that is i think that's more what i was trying to say not you come and tell us what to do it's that kind of just make sure we you know we will keep doing it we've made a commitment but it's, it's working together to make sure that we we are doing things the right way and we are getting to where we need to be. So do you have any policies or procedures to ensure that collaboration right now? Or yes. is it just... Um... Yes, we do. So through the committee system, obviously people can, can come to public meetings. However, we can facilitate workshops and task and finish groups. So this agenda, the, the, the issue you've brought today is on our work programme. In order for us to be able to push that piece of work forward, we would work with, with people across the city to come to task and finish groups and workshops so we can really deep dive into that issue and we can start to work together. So there are procedures in which we can utilise. We've not, you know, it's a new system that we're using and I'd be happy. I'd just spoken to Meredith beforehand about before you leave, if we can find out some availability or if there's people that aren't here today that you think would be valuable for us to listen to, to be able to design and direct our work programme. Uh, then we could do that. So yes, there are. There's workshops, task and finish groups. Um, I'm not going to say questionnaires because I don't find them valuable, if I'm honest, when you're just asking questions. We need a dialogue. So if I was, if I was someone who was born and raised in Sheffield and I went to primary school here, I did my secondary school education and then I went through hardship after hardship after hard, hardship and then decided I really wanted to inspire the community and represent my community because there was no teachers in Sheffield at the time that looked like me. And then I got a job and then I worked 10 times harder than my peers to become um, a head teacher. Would you protect me? Me? Yeah, would. would the councillors, would the officers, would the head of education, would the council protect me? And that is something that we need to address. That is, that is an issue that we do need to address, Meredith. I think the simple answer is yes. I think the complexity comes around. Um, you know, there are lots of lots of um, uh, issues that can 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 also happen. So, um, and so I don't know the context of the question, but the simple answer is is yes. Thank you. I've just been advised that I need to be mindful of time, and I have got some members that would like to come in on this. So, I've got uh, Councillor Hebe. I've got Councillor. Maroof, Councillor Turpin, and Councillor Bashra. Anyone else? 
Okay. Council uh, council. Council. Oh, Councillor Horner. Should I approach? Councillor Habey. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I've made a few notes, so I'm going to keep on looking down. But firstly, thank you for coming. Um, it shouldn't be your job to come here and tell us what to do. It should already be done. So I fully agree with you guys. Um, and I also know that the answers you got, you guys are not happy with. I agree. I think a lot of the answers were stock answers. Um, there's a few points from the answers that I just wanted to clarify. There's parts where it says that we are not responsible for certain schools and things, but I think this committee and everybody in here is responsible for every child in the city, or else this committee wouldn't exist if that if it wasn't. So yes, we are responsible for every single committee. Um, and I want to also say, you guys come in here, you may, or certain people, you guys may feel like you're attacking people, but racism is so embedded in the system that when you're attacking the system, it feels like you're attacking people and it, people take it personally. But at the end of the day, this committee, I think, promises to not just do workshops and get A3 pieces of paper and create spider diagrams, but and to then bin it and say that we come and discuss with communities, but to actually put something into play. Um, and a lot of the answers were about data, collaborating and recruitment. You probably heard that. I think it was in every answer. Um, but none of the answers had any accountability too tough. I'm here to say that we're all accountable 100%, regardless of what happens in Sheffield. We're 100% accountable for every head teacher, every child um, in Sheffield, and every individual as well, education and outside of education. You guys elected us, we work for you. So don't feel like this is, you know, going on deaf ears. You elected us, so all's lot on here and Dawn were chosen by you guys. So we have a right to fulfill every question and every answer that you guys need. Um, feel free, like I said, it's not your guys' job, but feel free to come in and tell us how we're doing our job wrong because there's a lot of cap in a lot, a lot of these answers and we're here to be honest and address every single question and answer. And if we're not happy with these answers, we should come and contact you. Like you guys said, we work for, like I said, we work for you a lot and you guys should not come. Um, there's a lot of you here. I just want to say you guys are inspiring. Groups like you are, well, like I said, shouldn't exist, but are the reason things like this get pushed. But now it's for us to take that off your hands and put every effort into pushing the right agenda and to tackling racism um, in Sheffield. But yeah, thank you for coming. You're a bunch of legends. And I hope, and it will, that change will happen. And this committee, in fact, this is my first ever education committee meeting, and I'm sure a lot of people here, if we've got decent level of representation. It doesn't make up the whole council, but in this committee, it's not decent. And I think we all have our own personal stakes in it as people of color that I'm speaking to in the council, in this committee, um, that have a responsibility and a duty. So yeah, like I said, thank you for telling us what we're doing wrong, because there's a lot that's been doing wrong, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, and there's a lot of dodging questions. However, we're here to make sure none of that happens again. And if we don't, you know, then we've done a shit job. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Turpin. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, thanks for coming. It's a really powerful message. Uh, I just want to say that I, I agree with you really on everything you say. And I, I just to highlight that I, I don't think it's the responsibility of 18 to 20 year olds to change the future. You know, when, when I was 18, Nobody expected me to change the future, and, and you know this is a, science, a society that's been created by people who came before you, and it's not your job to fix it. Although your contributions are welcome. Um, this time last year, I asked a question in in council about uh, EDI training for for councillors, and this was something that I tried to introduce it when I was on the exec the year before to have mandatory EDI training. And the answer I got this time last year was that uh, 33 members had done training and 11 more were booked on. So that's 44 out of 84 councillors. Not really good enough. At that point, the leader hadn't even done it, although we do, we do have a different leader now. Um, I think that... I agree, something else you're saying, you know, it's always about what we're going to do, and this is actually something I said last night, we're always talking about ambitions, and we're never talking about what we've done, you know, which is nothing, you know, there's a, by pure coincidence, there was, a, there was a, a, an automatic announcement over the tannoy for a fire, a fire um, drill, 
and it said no action is required and I joked yeah is that the council's strategy on racism then because that's how it feels I think I think Meredith is there's a, I've got a big job to do you know and, and really hope in my heart that you can do it I think we, we have been let down by senior leadership in the past try not to go into major detail but there, there, there was a senior leader who's no longer at the council I know three occasions that their response to someone calling out racism was to put in a formal complaint against them. They're not here anymore. But again, there's other senior leadership who could and should have challenged that at the time. Um, I don't think that the local authority all there in Sheffield is enough to support schools on, on really on, on anything, to be honest, with you, but certainly not on racism. And, and to say, I mean, I'm, not, I'm really not having to go at, at you, Mary, this, but to say that the, the local authority in, in this new world doesn't have that role. Well, there's 4,600 e emails sent between the local authority and Mercia Trust in regards to one local authority maintained school in eight months last year. So, you know, if the, if the local authority does want to be involved in a school, it will. Um, yeah, I... I I'm sorry that I haven't managed to do more. It's incredibly hard and there are obstacles everywhere, you know. And uh, I, I can't really imagine what it's like to be a person of colour in this world and just do my best. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Murrell. Uh, thank you, Chair. And just following on from what Councillor Turpin said, I can relate to being a person of colour. And uh, I, it really genuinely, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, the, the young people who've come here today. I think that's a, an excellent effort on your behalf, which you shouldn't be doing. We should be doing that as politicians, and we should be pushing on this. But uh, I can relate back to 40-odd years ago, and the issues that you guys are raising now, saying uh, you have to work three times as hard to be accepted in, in a profession, whether it's education or any other profession. I can assure you I suffered that, and I continue to suffer that. And in terms of anybody of colour, even now, every single day, we were having this conversation a little bit earlier on, and I said it at full council when I was last here, that we suffer it every single day, something will trigger something. But what I, what I would say is, and, and I think this is a challenge to us as well, Chair, is I remember I was at this council uh, as a senior officer many years ago, and the number of, uh, number of courses that we used to go on, and the number of reports that were done, and the number of actions that came out of that were probably not a great deal at all. Because fourth generation, you're sat here, and I'm, we've still got the issues of 40 years ago uh, that we're still talking about. So somewhere along the line, we've not got it right, have we? And every time anybody questions it, whether it's young people, <coughs> uh, elderly people, or whatever, people like me, we always get told the same answer. And I'm sorry about this, Chair, we're, I'm in it with you, to be fair. We always tell people we are doing something. We are going to be doing this next. We're going to be doing this next. And we'll do this next. And people go away. Reports are done. People are sent on courses. Boxes are ticked. We come back and say 96% of people have actually been on, on some course. I know it contradicts what Paul said. I'm not meaning it literally. But this is what we then come back to people with and say, this is what we've actually done. I was a commissioner uh, along with uh, Councillor Dale. And I had great reservations about sitting on the uh, Commission for Race Equality because I really did not want to be part of something where it's another piece of paper, another report that is done, and another uh, uh, initiative that we start. Uh, because I don't want to be a part of that. Forty years on, I think we need to move on quite considerably from where we are at the, at the present time. And any profession you look at, I've had lots of people who have contacted me. Uh, including from within the NHS, including from within the education system, and including from my own professional backgrounds. People are scared, genuinely scared to raise issues uh, as a person of colour because they will then get targeted. They will then be registered as a complaint. The complaint will go further forward. Eventually, you will be identified as who that person is. And then when you go for, uh, you go for any sort of promotion, it's never going to happen because somebody's going to say, oh, look, uh, look, that's a, a troublemaker. People have said that to me, Councillor Dale. And I've said, why don't you raise it? Raise it with me, within the council I'm talking about. Officers uh, have said under anonymity that there are issues in this council that we need to address. 
and senior officers are not addressing it. And I quite agree with what Councillor Turpin said. There was one senior officer who said, we need to do a lot. And I said to him, you've been here 25 years. Why haven't you done anything? Uh, because, and, and the answer was, well, we'll start it now. So really, I think the, the only takeaway I get from this is 40 years on, we've not moved. It grieves me, genuinely grieves me to be sat here talking about the same issues again and again. And, and I'm not into all these reports and uh, courses that people get sent on because nothing happens. The, 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 the numbers don't change. People don't get through the uh, education system as they should do. When they move on to a profession, they don't get promoted. These are the sort of things that we should be addressing. And I think we need to make a commitment. I certainly will. Uh, I don't want to sit on any committee which, which just gives you statistics and says this is what we've done. And good on you for coming here. My own children say this to me. Dad, you don't realize what's going, out, uh, going on out there. You might have been su successful in your career eventually, but we don't have to work three times as hard to be successful. You are third or fourth generation here. And, and really, Councillor uh, Dale and everybody on this committee, we have got to give these people uh, an absolute commitment. They shouldn't be coming to us. We should be going to them and saying, where, 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 why, are you, why are you struggling to progress in the system? Uh, I could say a lot more. I'm not happy, and I'm glad that you brought this forward, and I hope that you stay engaged with the process. From, from our perspective, from, uh, as a member here, uh, I am aggrieved, and I'm embarrassed that we're in this situation, genuinely. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Marie. Councillor Bashra. Thank you. First of all, um, I just want to say, you know, um, well done uh, for raising this. And uh, obviously anything around the racism is not easy, but you've done a really good job in terms of putting your questions across. Um, I just want to say one of the biggest concerns, obviously, uh, elected as a councillor and working in the community is, you know, young people losing hope. And that's what I'm afraid of, and I'm so glad that it's been brought. This is my first committee on the education, but I'm not uh, unaware of uh, some of the stuff that you've mentioned because working as a councillor and in the community, it's, it's often raised. <coughs> One of the things I started doing is engaging with schools in my ward, uh, starting to engage more and find out what, where the issues are, uh, just to identify some of the key stuff, how we can help the schools more. Um, but one of the things uh, I just want to, um, what I'm finding is, obviously yourself, uh, Meredith, uh, being in this post uh, and openly, uh, you know, uh, welcoming the um, collaboration work, wherever us councillors as well can uh, help, because uh, obviously uh, across the committee we've got a lot of expertise working in the community prior to being a councillor as well. Uh, I currently also uh, in the NHS, I work as a mental health worker, similar issues raised and I started doing some cultural awareness uh, uh, workshops uh, with professionals who actually have um, to be able to better support uh, you know, the patients or the carers from our uh, main uh, communities who actually come in. Similar stuff within the schools, if there's anything that is lacking, um, we should be held re responsible. Uh, for anything across the board, any kind of um, unfairness, unjust, uh, injustice or racism shouldn't be tolerated. And I think where it is happening, um, obviously through the um, Race Equality Commission report, there's lots been said that, and uh, it, it doesn't take a report to actually uh, evidence that, but at least, uh, you know, it's already out there. But I think with the report, what's happened is, it's all on paper and uh, recommendations have been put there and it is uh, about time action is needed and for you guys to actually come here and share this, um, it, it actually shows uh, for me, for young people to be facing this because like Maruk mentioned, you know, it, it's an ongoing thing, uh, it's happening, but it, it's heartbreaking. Uh, to be honest, as you were sharing these questions in my head was like, you know, you. You need to just get on with your life, get on with your education without worrying about, you know, all this uh, unfairness, un uh, injustice that's happening. And this is why I can assure you that members on this committee and why these committees are here is to be able to uh, pick up on these. You've shared this and I'm hoping, you know, like uh, we can move forward because it seems like it's, it's not being addressed. It's not, um, you know, like uh, it is affecting. I've seen many young people as well as parents, you know, the knock-on effect of um, everything what you've just said. 
and it's not good. And I think it's about time we should be taking action. And I will also offer openly here with Meredith, if there's anything I can do, um, I'm, I'm there because I think this is quite serious, especially when young people come in and um, raise these issues. But like um, Dawn's mentioned, it's high on the agenda. You are our future and please don't um, lose hope. Uh, keep raising it. And I think um, reporting is very important and I will echo the experiences that people who have reported or who are afraid of reporting is because they have shared the consequences of losing their jobs or being treated differently. And we shouldn't be going through all of that. So I think from this committee, and I'm sure everybody will agree that we will assure that we will do our best in terms of making sure that you don't actually have to come back and you know keep repeating, but what we should be reaching out to yourself and working together. And just lastly, the word hard to reach. Again, like yourself, I've never ever believed in that because it's about whoever's in this, <coughs> sorry, any profession to reach word is again something I, I don't go there. It's, it's our way, ways of how we be able to get through to communities. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bashra. Uh, Councillor Horner. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, this is my first education meeting. I was elected in May. Um, I come originally from the city of Bradford, which invented state education. Um, and I, I've had a, a lifelong passion for education. I, I helped set up Bradford School Governors uh, Advisory Group. We, we set up Bradford Asian Governors Group because we needed to address, we need to give people the opportunity to have a forum where they could speak. Um, one of the problems which there is is that uh, I said I have a passion for state education. I fought against grant maintained status. I don't like academy schools. We have to some degree been reduced to being a bystander. But even if you're a bystander, you can choose to be a bystander and walk, and, you know, you can see a problem on the other side of the road and walk on by. And I think that's some of the trap that we might have fallen into. Because school governing bodies in, in academies and grant maintained schools have power and they report to the DFE. They don't report to us in that sense. It, it's very easy for us to say, well, it's not our problem. You know, you can come and speak to us. It's much harder for you to go and speak to DFA. But that does not absolve us of the responsibility to speak. And I think that absolutely clearly we need to do that. And we need to engage particularly with those school governing bodies because what you're talking about is, in this case is, is employment practices. They're responsible for that. And we need to talk to them. And we need to, to, to uh, help them to understand what they're doing wrong and to, uh, uh, and to support them. Because that's where the problem is. You know, it's not that the council is ignoring it. It is that the council does, is not the employer. So that does not absolve us of the responsibility to say, this is wrong. We, it must change. And we must challenge the DFE. And you might expect me as a politician, you know, the next general election, you need to say to political parties, what are you going to do about control of, of, of schools? Because it should rest with local authorities. They're not perfect, but at least you've got the opportunity here to come and sh shout at us if you want to. And I don't mind if you do. Um, and I and absolutely value the fact that you've taken the courage to come and do this and to speak to us directly. Um, but, you know, we have been reduced to the standard of a, by of a bystander. But that does not absolve us of the need to speak and we need to engage with people. Particularly, we need to engage with school governing bodies and provide support to them because it is they who are clearly at the root of some of these practices and we need to say the DFE is not good enough either. Thank you, Councillor Horner. Uh, do you want to come back in, Councillor Haber? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to say all said and done, having we all have replied and said what we believe, I think when you're trying to tackle racism and structural racism, you're looking at this massive building or this massive black hole, not knowing who. If you take a good look around right now, everybody's heard what you had to say. So depending on what progress is made by the end of the year, we are either part of the problem or part of the solution. So look around, memorize who's in the room, and the next time you come back, you know who to ask. No. It's true. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Haver. You've just stole my final line. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you all for coming. As, as colleagues have just said, it's, it's not easy to come into a chamber and sit amongst members if you've not done it before and ask the questions that you're asking. 
um, but I do appreciate you bringing these questions and um, I would, if it's okay, because well, we will move on now onto the next part of the meeting, but if it's all right, if Meredith just comes to meet with you um, outside of the room to do some follow-up to see how we can communicate with you moving forward to, to show you what we're doing and what's being done. And if there are any individual issues that can't have been discussed in the room today, then I think it's it's right that Meredith is aware of those. So if you've got particular cases or incidents that might have happened, then this would be your opportunity out of the public arena to be able to speak to Meredith about that. Is that OK? Oh, sorry, Council Attorney. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that, because uh, obviously the, the, the members of the public who've come are welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, aren't they? And I just wondered if, because the next item being the work programme, that they may find a couple of items interesting to listen to. And that's completely up to you, whether you want to stay and listen to the... Have you got, have you got copies of the agenda if you're wanting to stay? Or there are some just on the table over there? You don't have to stay either. <laughs> you could always watch it back on webcast, because <laughs> it will be recorded. Yeah, so while I appreciate that Meredith will come and meet you, I would, I would like to take an opportunity to uh, follow up with you as well, if that's all right, on behalf of the committee, if you're, if you're open to that. Um, I don't just want to leave this dialogue here at this meeting. I think we need to, we need to carry on, because I don't think we've given it enough time, really. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Whitaker. Can I just quickly say, um, I live in an area where it's 95% white British. So prior to being a councillor, I didn't really encounter people of colour in my daily life virtually ever. And the first, and I suppose that racism didn't come into my life, that people will be living their lives experiencing racism on a daily basis. And the first time it brought home to me when my colleague sitting in my right here um, at a council meeting a few years ago um, stood up to speak and said that not a day goes by when he didn't experience some sort of act of racism, whether it was really minor or, or, or really major. And that made me feel incredibly sad and brought home to me that people are living their daily lives doing normal everyday stuff, and yet that's always in the back of their mind because they're always experiencing that. And for me, one of the... One of the really good things about being a city councillor is that I've met people of colour. In my ward, um, we got a, a hotel that became home to um, a large number of asylum seekers. And so I started to have dealings with that. And I met amazing people of colour. And then fellow councillors that I'd worked alongside. And in fact, the, the leader of our Lib Dem party in Sheffield, um, people of colour. And it, to me, it, it's really enriched my life. And so it does make me feel sad. But I'm glad you've come today. You said you shouldn't have to, but I'm really, really glad that you have. Because as Dawn says, you've pushed this to the top of the agenda because we clearly need, because we can't just carry on, you know, doing the same as we've done for the last 20, 40 years and, and then 20 years in the future. We, we can't just carry on. Things need to change so that you young people feel that you are truly valued because you should be. So thank you very much for coming. And I think I, I do hope that you collaborate with us moving forward. And as it said, not to tell us what to do, but, you know, I don't, I don't know what it feels like to, to be, you know, to, 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 to have racism. I don't know what it feels like personally. So we need people to tell us their stories, to discuss with us how they'd like things to be so that we can then take that away and, and see what changes that we can make. And you're right, you don't just want stock answers. You know, you want to know that things are happening. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Anne. Okay. So I am going to move on now to the next item on the agenda. Uh, Meredith, are you happy to go and, and see... Yeah, you're all right. Meredith comes out to see you and we'll get some contact details if that's okay.
Thank you, members, uh, for your input on the previous item. Um, the DCS has now gone out to meet with the group of young people who brought their questions um, so that we can continue, as we said, to continue this piece of work and work in collaboration uh, with our communities. Uh, we now go on to item number seven, which is the work programme on page 19. Uh, the presenting officer uh, is Fiona Martinez, Principal Democratic Services Officer, and the report contains recommendations for approval. So if everyone would like, Mark, Fiona, would you like to go through the work programme? Sure, okay. So obviously this is our first meeting of the, of the new year, and this is just an opportunity for you to give any feedback on the work programme in its current state. I should also um, mention to you that though that this is not currently on the work programme, it has been decided that there will be an extraordinary meeting of the Education, Children and Families Policy Committee on the 3rd of July. And I have contacted members and officers about this and it will be going into your diaries shortly. Um, this is to look at two items um, which were originally intended to come to today's committee, but which members felt they required more briefing on before, before reviewing and approving. So, um, as I say, invitations to that will go out. But this is a standing item on our agenda for you to give any feedback, any suggestions that you might want to on the work programme. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions on the work programme? I have a comment. Uh, Seanid? Hello, I have a bureaucratic comment, Chair. Um, it's something I actually raised this in this morning's meeting as well. Uh, it's a different committee. Um, where it says, oh, I'm sorry, page 20, number two, references from council or other committees. Can we actually have that as an item rather than tagged onto this so that people can actually see it as something that has come from either council or another committee um, and that that committee clearly considers it important and needs to be addressed by the count by this committee um, as, otherwise it just gets a bit swamped um, and I did want to ask on Monday's meeting which was just so important were there any implications for this committee coming out of that apart from the fact that we're all going to consult a lot better Monday's meeting of SN, SNR, because this morning's meeting, we had some stuff come out of it, and I didn't know if they were referring things out to other committees as well. Okay, so on that, I think there were, there were a couple of suggestions that items going to the Adult Health and Social Care Committee might also um, require briefings for the education team. So um, I think you're correct, yes, there's, there's going to be a lot more joined up working and a focus on cross-cutting issues. There were a number of issues that have been sent to me to include in our work programme, so they, those won't be on these papers currently, but when we um, come to the next committee meeting, there will be a number of changes based on that, yes. Thank you, Sean. In response to that, for anyone looking at the work programme, either in the chamber or at home, you will notice that... The work programme uh, is not complete and has little on it up, up beyond September. The reason for that, that's intentional, um, the reason for that has been that we've been waiting for Meredith to start as the new DCS for her to get an understanding of the portfolio and for new members of this committee to work in collaboration with officers to be able to develop our own work programme. And as you can see from today's meeting, we have got items that will arise that we will want to get on that work programme so there needs to be space on the work programme for important issues uh, to be put at the forefront of the agenda uh, what i would also um there was something else i was going to add to that and it's gone sorry everybody but it was really important as well oh yes cross-cutting issues sorry thank you fiona um the cross-cutting issues it is not just that there will be this portfolio will have cross-cutting issues across most other committees as well so we will be working with communities we will be working with the economy and skills committee and with uh, adults uh, health and social care for all age services so we will be looking at our work program and other work programs across the council to look at where we collaborate um, and do some cross committee working as well so that's kind of why we're not got a full uh, work program at the moment thank you yes Sean. 
thank you. Um, something that I was a bit confused about, and I don't know whether this is going to be a cross-cutting <coughs> issue, is about the community hubs. Because if we look at the community hubs, which come under communities and whatever that committee is called, um, and yet they, they appear to be sure start centres all over again. So I just wanted to make sure that if they're doing work with small children, that, that, that's, that, that we're looking at it. Thank you, Seanad. I think we need to be mindful of our hubs. There are community hubs, family hubs and youth hubs, and they are all different. So I think that is where we can probably end up going down a bit of a rabbit hole, which we don't know which hubs we're talking about. And the family hubs, whilst they are in the um, communities, parks and leisure uh, committee, the early years element of those um, hubs are the statutory responsibility of this committee. So we will be working across uh, committees on that piece of work from now. Thank you. Yeah, there's lots of hubs popping up, Janet. <laughs>
Yes. Yeah, because okay. it's something linked to it, and um, it's quite concerning. Um, some things that are coming up. Okay, thank you. Did you find yes. it? <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I did just want to check um, when uh, Sean had mentioned the uh, the family hubs. Um, it, just remind me to double check. So um, family hubs are currently based in the community's directorate. They are not specifically allocated to any particular committee. So that um, because of exactly what you've reflected on, Chair, that they, they cover a wide range of services. So they will go to, depending on what the specific issue is that comes up, they'll go to the most appropriate committee. If there are cross-cutting issues, it will be a, a bit like the ones you're referring to from Monday's strategy and resources meeting that there'll be a discussion about which committee should lead on that. But I, I know the intention amongst all, all members is that um, even if a particular committee is leading on a topic, it's very much the intention that all of the relevant members will have opportunities for briefings, joint workshops and things on those issues. Um, the other thing to say, Chair, is I know uh, a few issues have been raised for adding to the agenda. Um, we don't need to worry too much about the specific wording of those it's it is possible for those to go on as items that you wish to be developed to go on the agenda and as part of then of discussions and workshops we can um, work out exactly what those items should cover and how we can best make sure that we address those so as long as we know the the areas that you wish to have on the work program then officers can work those up with you um, ahead of the next meeting thank you so are we all agreed uh, with the work can I, group? Can I just, sorry, I? Dawn, just one more. Uh, I won't come to your committee again, I promise. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about last year and the work I did with Children's Library Service, which I, doesn't come under education and children, but, all, you know, it's all the cross-cutting-y stuff. And I was just thinking about the children's... Uh, book award, Sheffield Children's Book Award each year, which is a really prestigious prize for authors to win. And I don't know if we ever do anything in any of our committees about it. It just seems to happen. And I just think there ought to be something, I'm being as blobby as that, something uh, about it that ought to be discussed as a really good thing that Sheffield does and the engagement of schools in that, even if it's just a report for information or something. But it's a lot of fun. If you've ever been to the Crucible, when it's full of screaming children shouting for their favourite book, it's just an amazing experience. And we ought to talk about it. I, I will take that on to speak to offices across the council, so within education and also within uh, the libraries team, uh, to see if there is something that we're doing and how we can uh, get more involved in that. Thank you. So, item number eight, threshold of need and the need to refresh is on page 33 of the agenda reports pack and the preventing of presenting officer is uh, Mark Storff. The report contains recommendations for approval. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Stowe from Assistant Director in Children and Families, and I'm also my colleague Louise has joined me. Louise. Good afternoon, everyone. Louise Bauer, I'm Service Manager in Children and Family Services. So, um, uh, um, members, uh, myself and Louise are presenting to committee today a revised version of Sheffield's Threshold of Need Guidance Document. The Threshold of Need Guidance Document is a partnership document to support practitioners in their decision making and guide them towards appropriate prevention and intervention services. And is a document directed by the statutory guidance working together to safeguard in children 2008, which is a guide to interagency working to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. So the threshold of the threshold document is intended to enable practitioners to make decisions about how best to respond to the needs of children, young people, and families, to support getting families uh, access to the right help at the right time, and to feel safe and, and practitioners to feel safe and confident in their decision making. Bit of background. Revision of the Sheffield uh, threshold of need was identified as required by, in spring 2022 by the Improvement Board and Sheffield's Children's Safeguarding Partnership Executive Board in order to incorporate practice changes since the last version, which was published in 2017. 
So uh, an example would be the developments around um, practice related harm outside the home. So the, we've also uh, re, uh, built the, the threshold guidance from a level, five levels of need to four levels of need, which brings Sheffield into line with the majority of other local authorities, including regional colleagues, as Sheffield uh, was an outlier in using that five levels of need guidance. So for example, partners who work with multiple local authorities, such as the Sheffield Children's Hospital, uh, this move to four levels gives some consistency when applying threshold uh, consideration for the children and people they work with. Therefore, on, on that basis, I am recommending the revised threshold of need guidance document is approved by the committee for Sheffield Council use, uh, with a view to it also being adopted by partners across Sheffield. Thank you. Okay, just to add, um, we have got sign off from the exec group of the Sheffield Children's Safeguarding Partnership that they're happy with the content. Um, the format that you've got in your appendix obviously is the unglossy version. In terms of the format, we are looking at a web based version um, that will be hosted on the Sheffield Children's Safeguarding Partnership website with lots of hyperlinks so that the actual document itself is quite short but if practitioners want to need additional information about any of the elements within the threshold guidance, that is easily available. So it will kind of expand as, as people need more information, but be quite a concise document for people to uh, really support their, their practice and decision making. So in, in terms of why we've done what we've done with the, the guidance document, we started off by asking across the partnership um, for some feedback from frontline practitioners in terms of what are their best hopes from a revision of the threshold of need guidance. And the feedback came back quite loud and clear that they wanted a document that was shorter, easier to use, more visual, so more visual prompts that could be used in poster form. Um, they wanted it to be online, widespread um, uh, enthusiasm for moving that to that four sector model in line with the rest of South Yorkshire rather than the five sector model that we were al alone using in Sheffield. And people wanted more clarity around some specific issues, so specifically around neglect, so specific, specifically around contextual safeguarding and harm around the home, um, more emphasis on educational neglect, bearing in mind the attendance and exclusion rates within Sheffield, um, and more emphasis on um, the way that we now work with domestic abuse, whole family use in the safe and together model. Um, so within the wording and the content of what we've got within the guidance, um, we've learned from recent serious case reviews in Sheffield to make sure that the issues that have been highlighted as affecting Sheffield children and families is very clear within the, the guidance, what additional um, clarity is needed about decision making, specifically about things like harmful sexual behaviour, what tools to use to assess, um, and to make sure that we've learned from some of the multi-agency audits that have been held as part of the safeguarding partnership to make sure that if they're um, in the previous guidance, what some of the practitioners felt was there was a very clear description of what the child protection element of a, of a concern looked like, a very clear description of what it might look like at threshold two, but actually the, not that graduation in between, which made that made, meant that practitioners sometimes struggled to know whether what they were seeing with the child or the young person before them needed to be referred in for child protection or whether it needed help and support. So we've tried to address all of that within the, the contents of the document that you've got in front of you. Thank you. Do any members have any questions on the report? Councillor Turpin. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for bringing this. It looks uh, really good and you know, really acknowledge that it's, uh, you know, well, hey, we, we ought to be using the same model as, as uh, the rest of the people in our region, but also that it looks really streamlined and clear and it is a, a complicated subject with many different facets, isn't there? Um, so yeah, ex excellent work, I think. Um, just wanted to ask, and I've just scrolled away from the line that you've actually used, but I think it was something like you, that um, the partners will adopt the model. So will there be a, um, uh, will that be a, a statutory or mandatory adoption of this model? You know, will, will those partners, is, it's like, will they be made to do this or do they have to do this in some way? They've effectively already signed up through, through the Executive uh, Safeguarding Partnership Board, so it's, it's, it's agreed at the strategic level that we will be adopting that. Um, there's, there's practice uh, sessions, there's education sessions that's, come, that's going to go out once we've, uh, we, we've agreed the model. And, and that will be delivering to all across the, across the partnership sort of learning on how to deliver and, and how to interpret the, the document that we've, we've, we've made. 
and, and then further in terms of implementation, we've got so we've had a, a part of the, the workforce, um, part of the, the work stream development has been looking at the actual structure and content, which is what you've got in front of you. Obviously, there needs to be further work to make it glossy and even more user friendly. Um, but in terms of implementation, we're looking at multi agency training um, that's available for everyone through the early health partnership training offer. Um, but also that it's embedded within the working together training that's offered through the um, safeguarding partnership, um, that there's some online video training that people can access at any time, any point, so short, concise pieces of training that people can use to support their decision making. Um, and it's going to be embedded in terms of um, people will be directed to it through the, the children's portal landing page so that as and when people have got a concern about a child, um, it's really easy for them to find the threshold of need guidance to help to assess what should they do next in terms of their concerns. Yeah, Councillor Turpin. Sorry. Um, I was just going to... Uh, is, is this a, a live document or is there a, a, re a regular review period? I think that's been the previous issue. We didn't review it, so it was six and a half years since the last one, so we are looking at a, a cycle to review it. Um, it's, it's to be decided yet, but probably two to three years it needs that review because otherwise it's a, it's a large document. It took us a year to get to this point, and we want to be uh, consistent around that and practice changes, guidance changes, legislation changes, and we need to be able to adopt that when, when it comes along. But three years is probably the right time, but it's two to three years. We just need to make that decision yet with the partnership. Thank you. Councillor Basham. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you in terms of, um, this is really good, um, obviously, <coughs> especially, you know, um, improving the shorter, easy to read uh, version, because uh, working in the community, um, these have been uh, raised. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, maybe you've already covered it, you know, the <coughs> within this um, whole thing, uh, the element of our culturally sensitivity um, is that something there because uh, the only reason I bring this up is because uh, there's been two um, incidents within the community uh, when a young um, young person needed the support but um, once they reached out the confidentiality was broken um, and uh, the knock-on effect was that the individuals lost the trust in <coughs> reaching out for support uh, and that was an element in terms of uh, making uh, the organisation aware that the cultural sensitivity around it, not to involve police till it's needed, it just needed uh, an awareness and speaking uh, to the family members. But unfortunately, uh, without the individual's consent, further, while she was getting the support, the police were sent into the home and it had a complete... Uh, devastating impact um, and obviously but I intervened because this was prior to being a counsellor uh, with other reasons um, but tried to you know like um, mend some relationships uh, but it, it left um, uh, some horrible uh, experiences amongst uh, certain individuals who really rely on these services and could really need need them at those um, you know uh, serious serious times so it's just being aware that the sensitivity around um, the whole family uh, in certain situations. So there's a, a specific section, um, I, I can't remember the page number off the top of my head, but within within the first few elements, it's about, about fifth in the document, is a specific section about consent and information sharing. Um, so what, what we've tried to do within that is clarify that it, we would normally work with families' consent uh, because we want to, wherever possible treat parents as partners, um, uh, parents as protective factors, and we want to work honestly and transparently with parents um, when there are issues relating to their children. I think perhaps what you're talking about is where young people are um, competent to make their own decisions and access services independently. Yeah, so I think perhaps that's an issue around um, how making sure that all of our services not just within children's services but across the early help partnership training offer have got um, access to cultural competency training um, so that is something that we've been discussing in our workforce meetings um, we've done some cultural competency audits um, certainly within children's services um, we're very aware that there's um, different issues for different communities and we want to make sure that we we get it right in terms of offering help and support without um, causing additional 
issues for the children and young people that we work with. Thank you. Because obviously that's really important because obviously the services are there to protect and safeguard them. But if those individuals feel, you know, they, they trust, they can't trust um, for various reasons, then basically it's, um, it's difficult because they, we're just throwing them into deeper problems. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bash, for an important question there. Any more questions? Councillor Walker. Um, well, first of all, thank you for bringing this to us, and it just re it reads really, really well. Um, and if it's put into practice, you can <laughs> think it's going to work really well. Um, if practitioners take this on board, do we think that the, it will go a long way towards making sure families don't slip through the net? Um, I've had sort of personal experience of working in the voluntary sector with families where clearly families have slipped through the net big style and we think this strategy will prevent that from happening. So uh, I, th I think there's, there's two things to that. So the, the first thing is about the actual document and, and about how widespread um, it's used because I think in terms of families um, slipping through the net, I think that's about us as a city making sure that all services who work with children, young people and families recognise their part as their, their role as part of a safeguarding system as part of an early help network of support. So I think it's about upskilling all of those who work with children, young people and families um, to understand how to use a threshold of need and that they have got a duty to identify and assess the needs of children and young people with additional needs who might benefit from that help and support. So I think this is a tool um, in terms of the training and upskilling. Um, but I think there is more work for us to do about upskilling that wider early help workforce, not just within um, the partnership, but in terms of voluntary community, faith sector organisations, um, to make sure that we've got a workforce development offer for everyone and anyone who works in Sheffield, who works with children and people and families, to make sure they feel skilled and supported to identify, assess, use this document, and to get the help that families need. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hayden. Hi, um, this just came to me, so I don't know how much if I missed the mark or not. But does this guidance discuss calling the police on children in schools and how to safeguard it through that? As you know, there was a case called Child Q where um, young, disproportionately BME children were stripped, searched in the school premises by the school calling them. And there was a guidance that was set out to assess and balance the risk of potential strip searches to young children in schools um, and how it would impact their mental health and well-being. Does the guidance discuss anything of that to schools and how to navigate that situation? It, it doesn't specifically, because it, it's, it's, it's that guidance about what the, the practitioner thinks is the next step. So it uses the guide to look at where so the, the, the believed uh, situation fits. So uh, if it's a situation where they think there's a safeguarding or behavioural yeah. concern, and, and they call the police, for example, because on the back of that, then there's a conversation, I think, between what the police and the schools do and how we can manage and support that. Because the, the threshold is, 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 is that it's that graduated approach to the, the steps of need for the child. And it, and, it, and it can be guidance for that. So you, you wouldn't specifically talk in, as a, in, in terms of what you've just described in there. Could it be added to it? I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what, what you're asking about is the safeguarding policies of the police. Yeah. Um, so what this document... Well, more so the school's guidance, if they should, before they should call the police, they assess the mental health and well-being of the student. So it's more for the schools to assess that before they call the police. Yeah, I'm just so bring, sorry, can I just bring... I think Sally wants to come in. Thanks, Sally. Sorry, Louise. I just thought she were quite eager. <laughs> um, so just in terms of the um, case of Child Q, um, in terms of the threshold of need guidance, that would be level four. We would be looking at, at that's a safeguarding issue, and that's something that we'd normally do with child protection with the police. Given the circumstances of something like um, that, we do have relationships with the police when it's an issue about the police force, about being able to work with other police forces such as West Yorkshire um, if it would not be appropriate to go to the rest of South Yorkshire. So those conversations are, are ongoing. If there is any issues such as allegations, not as extreme as a strip and search in school, then we do work with um, education um, safeguarding advisors. We've got resources within the early help team, but also with interest of children and social care about having those conversations and addressing it. Not something that we're aware of in this city, and if it was something aware of, regardless of threshold of need guidance, we would. It is a, a, a serious concern. It is safeguarding, and, and we would respond. Well, thank you for that. Um, 
shed in that light and make sense. Um, but I'm always prevent rather than cure, so I don't think we should kind of like wait for Sheffield to have cases so just to put it in the guidance. There's ongoing safeguard and training that's, yeah. that's, that's all the time, and there's also work that we do with South Yorkshire Police um, about um, being child focused, about having that appropriate response for children, about not arresting children if we don't need to, and that relationship building practice. And we persevere about that consistently, and that is going to be something that we can never take his foot off pedal with. It's a, an absolute constant um, conversation and development that we have with the police. Thank you. So just to get right, those ongoing conversations might lead for, um, to it being implemented into this. Yeah, just um, we have got a, a small team within Sheffield City Council that do the safeguarding training specifically for school designated safeguarding leads, um, and I've got I have meetings with them anyway about making sure that early help. Um, is part of that training offer, so I can absolutely take that issue to them to make sure it's covered within the um, safeguarding training and the refresh training uh, for sca school safeguarding leads that all designated safeguarding leads and deputy safeguarding leads attend. Brilliant, thank you. But just so I can understand, I don't like leaving someone not fully understanding. Would the ongoing conversations you mentioned, would, could it eventually lead it to being implemented into the guidance? Or am I just missing the mark? So this guidance runs alongside the national guidance um, and working together to protect children. So in terms of the threshold of need, the level four is about safeguarding. Um, so that alongside that, we've got working together to safeguard children, which has got about strategies which runs in Section 47 US, all the process there, um, which runs alongside Children Act. So this is just runs alongside of the guidance is there and working together to safeguard children is a joint document. It's not children's services. It is for health, for education, for police. And it's something that we all work to, um, and it's our duty to work to. And locally, there's scrutiny of, of that. So we have a, a South Yorkshire um, Strategic Safeguarding Partnership, which has um, district commanders, director of children's services from across the board and health and various others. And then on a regional level, we have the um, Sheffield Safeguarding Children Partnership, um, which Meredith will be attending as she comes and Councillor Dale attends and that's an arena to have that scrutiny as well which could be that we don't think that if, if there were a concern we didn't think safeguarding leads for example were accessing rights training and um, safeguarding trainings actually that could be escalated in there so that there is that scrutiny from other areas as well so it's not just as simple as we've got the guidance we've got the threshold document um, it is about a lot of scrutiny and support that runs alongside Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anyone else got any questions or comments on the report? Thank you. So uh, this committee uh, is being asked to approve the revised threshold of need guidance for Sheffield City Council use and with a view to it also being adopted by partners across Sheffield. Uh, are we all agreed? I'll take signs and nods as agreement. Thank you very much. That's agreed. Thank you. So we now go on to item number nine, the future of school improvement. Um, Sheffield City Council activities and contracting with Learn Sheffield. This is on page 61 of the agenda pack and the presenting officer is Stephen Middleton. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Middleton, Schools Advisor for the Council, uh, presenting a report of the Strategic Director of Children's Services on the future of school improvement. Um, this report follows a report that was presented to the committee back in December, uh, which presented options for the future funding of Sheffield Skip City Council School Improvements activities. Um, and at that time, we outlined that further investigative work had to be undertaken as to how best to deliver these activities. Um, this report is to give you an update on the work that's taken place and, and the recommendations that came out of that. So um, I'm just going to run you through some of the key points of, from the report. So the, the main recommendations are that um, the, the committee agrees that the council should continue to directly deliver some statutory school improvement services according to established practices and processes. And also that the council should no longer look to insource all improvement services and instead officers will look to move forward the proposal for a new contract for limited school improvement services um, with Learn Sheffield from September 1st, 2023. 
just to um, refresh your, your memory about how, how the situation has evolved. Um, back in December, um, we presented that the, um, until recently, the council had utilized a school, improve, a school improvement monitoring and brokering grant, um, otherwise known as a grant, to support investments into the Learn Sheffield Commission. And since 2017, the grant has provided uh, support to the councils to fulfill their core school improvement activities. In October 21, the ESFA launched a consultation on the future of the grant, and um, from uh, March 22, that grant was reduced by 50%, with a full removal of the grant from March 23. So in recognition of the upcoming removal of the grant in December 22, officers recommended to the committee that the council fulfill core school improvement activities currently provided by Learn Sheffield directly to schools and that that should be investigated further as a preferred option for the future. At that time, the committee were minded to agree to insourcing, subject to having the necessary information in front of them. Um, it had originally been anticipated that the final decision would be possible early in the new year. However, in March 23, officers requested a delay to the decision to allow for more exploratory work to be undertaken. So this is a, a further update from March 23. So as part of the investigations approved by the committee, officers have consulted with stakeholders across the city, including local head teachers, governors, and Learn Sheffield. And one of the outcomes of the consultation was a proposal from Learn Sheffield that they could actually continue to fulfill activities on behalf of the council within the reduced budget now available. The council would then continue to meet the statutory school improvement responsibilities it currently provides through existing practices and processes. However, in the case of limited areas where there's no existing capacity within the council to meet the statutory duties, for example, the monitoring and moderation of key stage assessments, then these responsibilities would continue to be contracted out. In addition, Learn Sheffield would also continue to deliver complementary non-statutory services, um, for example, Ofsted inspection support and head teacher recruitment support. Having considered the proposal, officers believe it represents the best value for ensuring statutory responsibilities continue to be met and that high standards of school improvement activity continue to be in place across the city. The cash value of the previous contract was 268,000. Of this, following the removal of the reduced grant, 131,000 remains available for investment and the estimated value of the new contract is 97,000. So therefore, it's no longer the officer recommendation that these services are insourced and the committee is asked to give its approval to this change of approach to permit officers to move forward the proposal for a contract for limited school improvement activities. Well done, Stephen. You've picked up Andrew, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you very much. So Andrew Jones, Director of Education Skills. And just to add, the, specifically the activities that we are looking at to learn Sheffield to deliver, we don't believe that we have the capacity to do that ourselves. So, for example, one of them is the, there's a statutory requirement to moderate 25% of schools where they have key stage one children and specifically to moderate their writing. And that involves a short-term um, piece of activity in the summer term, um, which would actually require um, expertise that we don't currently have in the local authority. They have, they've been doing that for us in, in Learn Sheffield, so that's an example of why we would want them to actually continue that activity. Key Stage 2, 10% um, uh, SAPS, uh, um, of schools have to be audited about that, and it's about undertaking that. And then also, Steve mentioned um, head teacher appointments and also um, um, uh, government. Uh, what was the other one? Sorry, I did that. So, Ofsted inspection, Ofsted, Ofsted inspection preparation. And Learn Sheffield is best place to do that given the number of ex-inspectors that it has there. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Stephen. Do any members have any questions on this report? Councillor Murray. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm um, just looking at page 65, 1.3.5, 1. Uh, the actual figures. Is the 97K, uh, is that the total value of the contract or is that uh, supplemented by contributions from schools? 
So, so yes, that would be the total value of the contract that the council would commission from Learn Sheffield. Schools then themselves pay, schools and academies then pay additional sums to Learn Sheffield. So that's not, that doesn't represent the totality of their budget. Uh, schools then, uh, you know, paying, I think in the current, current academic year, I think it's roughly about half a million, 500,000, I think, that right. schools pay for, for services back from Learn Sheffield. I just wanted a clarification on that because... Uh, just referring back to what we were discussing right at the beginning of this uh, meeting, uh, there seems to be a lot of improvement work that we need to carry out in schools, and the budget doesn't seem to be high enough to actually deliver that sort of uh, training. So we could be sat here promising people all sorts of things. Not This is not for yourselves. This is for us. Promising all sorts of things, and yet we don't have the budget to actually deliver it. So we'll be back in the same position again. So I'm assuming this, is, this will be looked at again in two years' time when the contract expires. Yes, indeed, because uh, this contract is for two years. Clear, I'm very mindful of I'm, I see you as an officer and your members, at the end of the day, members drive policy and, uh, and actually what has been agreed in terms of what you want us to focus and deliver on, not least of which the discussion that took place earlier, we will have to look at resources in order to do that. We'll have to look at what we are doing and it might involve stock and doing some other things in order to do that to, but to be clear we will obviously prioritize uh, members priorities around that thank you thank you andrew that's what i was trying to get at to be fair is a lot of delivery needs to be done but yet the budget doesn't seem to reflect that i'm it's very rare i say this that the budget isn't enough but this is doesn't look enough to me so on that councillor uh Murray, the Obviously, the, the council still has a number of officers who work in relation to school effectiveness and school improvement. So we have our own uh, budget and we have our own officers and activity. And that's what I mean, that some of that would have to be, if it's considered to be an additional commitment, we would have to repurpose some of that. But actually, some of the things I think that you were talking about earlier are already commitments as well. It's about delivering those. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If I could, if I could just ask, well, sorry, Paul, I will bring you in. But if I could just ask a question on that, from the commitment we just made at the beginning of this meeting, the, the dialogue that we've had with Learn Sheffield about delivering some of the recommendations through the Race Equality Commission into schools, are we then proposing that this ninety-seven thousand won't cover that work? And and would they offer their, the offer there, would the suggestion then be that schools would have to pay for that service, or are we looking at as a council look, re looking at that piece of work with Learn Sheffield in addition to this? So the, the 97K specifically relates to the four areas of activity that Steve has um, described. Um, Learn Sheffield have a traded service in relation to governor um, support and whatever commitment has been made today in relation to that, we, we will need to go back and look at our budget. So I, it would be my recommendation that we accept the paper today to allow us to in, uh, initiate that contract and then we will come back to the committee with further proposals around any amendments we might need to make to the education skills budget and anything that any resources we need to set aside for the commitments the committee's made. Thank you. Meredith then Paul then Ian. Thank you. Just around um, some of the commitments we made today I mean there are it, it is partly schools who need to be paying for it and it's about the conversation with Learn Sheffield about the the right training opportunities and the capturing of data. There is something about us going away and making sure that the right, there is the right money from our budget as well. But it is a, you know, it is a collective responsibility. And by that, therefore, it means that their collective budgets need to be making sure that this is a priority. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Turpin. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for coming to speak to us. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a little bit concerned in that um, the, 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 the reasons around why to extend this contract for two years seem to be because it's cheap. And uh, I'm bearing in mind, I had a conversation with an officer 18 months ago who, who mentioned that this, this moment in time was coming and, and something else needed to be done. And that there was a general acceptance that Learn Sheffield had not been delivering a high quality service. Yet here we are in the end of June with the contracts running out in the end of August. And, and it really feels like there's no option but to extend it. You know, we can't ch chuck the schools and the kids under the bus by just saying, well, the service Lord Sheffield have been provided isn't good enough, but you know what, we, we, we didn't sort something out 
when we had the time, so we're going to have to extend it. It just doesn't feel right. I mean, there's, I'd, I've, I've had interactions with Lady Sheffield's emails going unanswered, appointments not kept, people turning up to meetings that never existed, people turning up to the wrong times at meetings, you know, things that do get done taking a long time. And then I think the, the worst uh, situation was having maladvice during an Ofsted inspection. You know, it's like there's, this, this is the reason really why ultimately why the earlier, uh, earlier point of the meeting, an item went onto the work programme to fully appraise the service that Lord Sheffield has been providing. Because it's very difficult, you know, without our own anecdotal experiences to look at what are we actually getting for our schools in Sheffield. And, um, and so, I mean, that's going to be an important body of work to, to go forward and, and also my colleague uh, Mal also added that we, there should be a, a special focus on what is Learn Sheffield doing in a proactive way to deal with racism in education. Um, so yeah, I am disappointed that we've come to this point, bearing in mind the conversation I had 18 months ago. Um, and I, I, I would propose an, an amendment to the, to the recommendations when we get to that point, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I think going back to what we were talking about earlier, <clears throat> the support for school governors. The City of Bradford had an excellent school governor support service. Now, that was in the days, and I've made the point before, about when most schools were run by the local authority. But if we're to tackle a number of the issues that came up at the beginning of this meeting, a lot of that rests with the governing bodies of those schools. And if we don't provide a service to those people to train people to point out where they're where they're going wrong, what their responsibilities are, then we will fail to, to deal with the problem. And so I, I think it is important to say here that we need to look clearly, and I think there's a sense from what, what other members have said, uh, of the support we're giving to these governing bodies. I mean, as I say, I, I make no apology for saying I'd rather all these schools were under local authority control. That's always been my view, and it, it will not change. But they're not. But we have to reach out uh, and make that effort um, and I wonder whether this is doing that. Thank you. Andrew, do you want to come back? And then I've got Councillor Basher. I, I mean, just to pick up both points, and particularly uh, Councillor Turpin, because clearly people will have different experience of services that they uh, uh, pay for. But just to be clear, the overwhelming majority of schools in Sheffield subscribe to Learn Sheffield, it's about 90% of schools and the feedback that they provide in relation to the service that they receive is, is overwhelmingly positive, which is not to say those two things can't sit side by side and the experience that you've had you know, isn't equally um, authentic um, on that basis. Um, it's not necessarily that this is the cheapest way of doing it, it's for example the um, for example, on Key Stage 1 uh, at writing moderation, they have the expertise to do that and we don't. Um, so actually, it doesn't make sense to actually go somewhere else in order to do that. The outcomes are positive and I would suggest, Chair, that in the autumn term, again for the work programme, I know Councillor Havey asked for uh, an appraisal of, uh, of the impact of uh, Learn Sheffield and the, and the uh, contract. But I would suggest that we perhaps do that in the autumn term, that we bring along the chief executive of uh, Learn Sheffield and the committee is able to um, ask some questions to him directly about the impact, of their, uh, the impact of their work. But for example, one statistic would be in terms of uh, schools that are um, good or outstanding by Ofsted, we are at the national average for that, whereas in 2019 we were below the national average, so that's some of the work that Learn Sheffield has done. So I don't deny that actually there may be different um, experiences um, of that. In relation to governor training, uh, Meredith has already alluded to the fact that it's quite a complex pattern of uh, funding and we don't actually, we don't receive or have the funding in order to do that. But I think Council Horn, the way in which to do that would be to work through our relationships with schools, uh, to actually identify a need in relation to uh, to that, and then to actually determine how we best can lead in that space uh, on behalf of the council in relation to governing bodies. Thank you, Councillor Bashra. Okay, first of all, thank you uh, for sharing this and um, your work as well. Um, <coughs> It is a new area for me, so it's just to understand 
um, the bit about the school forum um, no longer, you know, um, how does it say, fund school improvement with the Learn Sheffield. Um, maybe I've uh, not come across. Uh, so if you can just clarify some, uh, give me a little bit of insight to that. And um, obviously looking at uh, some of the um, issues the young people have raised in everything day is quite concerning um, in terms of, you know, um, what we're uh, trying to achieve uh, to make sure that, you know, um, the schools are supported. Uh, so if you can just share a little bit about this, the school forum and what that is and why they don't feel that to support yourselves. Have I understood that right? Um, so the, um, I'm looking across the mark, you might uh, be able to help me in a minute. So I'm just trying to delve in my memory. About 20 years ago, the way in, in which the school system is funded uh, was changed. So the school system is funded through a grant that's received from the government called the Dedicated Schools Grant, DSG for short. And it's got four uh, main blocks in it. It's got the high needs block, which is what we use to fund um, support and provision for children with special needs. It's got the early years block, which is what we use to fund um, early years provision, both um, voluntary uh, and also uh, voluntary private and also um, um, state nurseries as well, in relation to uh, the, the bit of the offer that is statutory. Um, and it's also got um, it's also got the schools block, and the schools block is from within which school budgets actually then um, arise. And finally, it's got something called the central services grant. So all of those four things go together. Mark, what's the total uh, of our allocation? Thanks. Well, the contribution of Sheffield is around £620 million. That's what we receive from the government for the school system. So the, so the change that took place 20 years ago is that whereas the council uh, members and officers would have determined how that uh, DSG funding was used, it's the response has been given to schools directly. So they have, a, they have a forum, the schools forum, they elect representatives to the schools forum. Um, over time, as academies have risen, the, the balance on the school forum has to reflect uh, the balance of the school uh, system um, in Sheffield. So whereas 20 years ago, everybody would have been uh, from a maintained school, over time that's actually shifted. And the more schools that we have that are academies, the more academy representatives there are on the schools forum. And they take decisions about how that DSG funding is used based upon recommendations from officers. So part of that um, is the grant which forms part of the DSG that we've, we've referred to. Uh, and in 2021, when we first knew that that grant was going to be consulted in terms of whether to maintain it, or we went to the schools forum to explain that. And one of the options that the government gave to schools was, um, you call it de-delegation, but it, the, the money comes in from that DSG in a big block, and we then delegate that out through a formula to school. Probably worth chair was coming back to a future committee to actually go through some of this uh, and, and just give the committee more detail about it. Um, so the government, one, once the grant that we were using to pay Learn Chef for was, was going to be removed, they gave the schools the option of us de-delegating, in other words, taking back from their budgets the money to pay for Learn Chef for um, And we asked schools about that, we did a consultation with them, and overwhelming that they asked us not to do that. So from August this year is the last point at which any de-delegation takes place. And from September, it's the school's wish that actually that they pay for uh, services directly from Learn Sheffield. And on the four areas that I've described to you, it's our recommendation that we procure those from Learn Sheffield, given that we don't have direct the expertise to do that in the council. Does that answer your question? Clear, Councillor Bushra, yeah. Right. I just want to add one comment. So the school forum is a statutory requirement and all local authorities need to have one. And the link back to this uh, committee is Councillor Dondale. She's our rep on school forum. And the way it's structured is Councillor Dondale doesn't have voting right. Only the school members can vote on when it comes to a decision related to school finances. But Councillor Dondale represents the council views on forum. 
Does anyone else have any more questions or comments on this report? Thank you. So, um, the recommendations of this report are to agree that the Council should continue to directly deliver some statutory school improvement services according to established practices and processes. Also agree that the Council should not now look to insource all school improvement services and notes that whilst the current contract for school improvement activities to learn Sheffield will expire on the 31st of August 2023, officers will look to move forward the proposal for a new contract for limited school improvement activities from the 1st of September 2023 for two years and notes that Sheffield City Council will continue as a member of Learn Sheffield and remain the supervising authority for Learn Sheffield. I understand Councillor Turpin you're wanting to make an amendment, propose an amendment? Yes, thank you. Um, just a simple amendment that um, the uh, contract is uh, extended for one year, not two years. Thank you. Could I ask uh, as officers that understand that there might be any implications to that? Could it be from what? Could it be, if I can just come back on that, could it be proposed two years based on outcomes after one year? I'm just mindful of employment at Learn Sheffield, so we could, you know, would, the second year would be dependent on um, outcomes on year one. Wouldn't we have to specify what those outcomes were now, though? I think we need to take some officer advice on that. And Councillor Maru, did you want to make? Um, I think uh, we, we, we go along with the recommendation and following on from what Paul had said, uh, probably some sort of review with, uh, with, with milestones after one year, because there's got to be a review to review something. You can't just review the whole contract. Yep, so if Sarah can give us some legal advice. Yeah, just to clarify, Chair, that um, the value of this contract is such that actually the decisions relating to the contract would be normally reserved to officers. The reason it's come back to committee is because you'd previously expressed, expressed interest in potentially insourcing this service. So you can say that you want to re-look at insourcing again in a year's time. It's not a decision that's reserved to this committee to specifically dictate the length of the contract with a particular provider so it's not within the powers of this committee as delegated by council to say the specific contract would be reviewed or, or based on outcomes or things those are reserved to officers it would have to be that this committee was saying it wanted to reconsider that insourcing question in a shorter period of time than is currently being proposed So would you suggest a, a point four to cover those points rather than amending the existing points, I mean? Sorry, Councillor Timmy, I don't know uh, to address which points. The, so um, the points that I make and, and uh, Mahmoud makes as well about, look, and, and also, sorry, the chair made, <laughs> about that we, we look at, um, that we specify conditions at which, by the end of one year, or milestones, I think was the other word used. Um, it, it just is simply a decision that isn't available to this committee. It's not reserved to you. Could, well, can I ask that why we've been asked to make the decision then, if it's not to us? The decision you've been asked to make is to make the decision to not proceed with insourcing, noting the intention of officers to let a short-term contract. Andrew. I'm just to reassure Councillor Turpin, we will obviously through contract management processes be reviewing the impact of the contracts and it's not, you know, there's no contract with the council where you get it for two years regardless of what happens uh, and I think Councillor Havey's already requested that we actually bring before the committee uh, a discussion in the next, uh, uh, well, I'm looking in the school years, but from September. Um, in relation to the impact of, uh, of Learn Sheffield, and I think we can explore some of those questions as part of that. Uh, and clearly, officers will be cognizant of the impact through key performance indicators on the contract. Melody. So, thanks, thanks, Andrea. That's absolutely right. And I think that um, one of the conversations we, uh, I think, we'll have is how um, we, we bring uh, annual information about how our children are attaining. 
how do we link that then to Learn Sheffield and also to the regional um, delivery director, the DFE, and perhaps have that conversation in totality um, within the committee. Now, we need to look at when the timing is right, and there might be a review for um, a September for Learn Sheffield, but actually those results are validated later in the autumn term, beginning of the um, spring term. But if we get into that cycle on an annual basis of looking at what we are doing around um, school attainment, what Learn Sheffield is doing, and that relationship that we're um, we're committing to within this contract and then also the really important part the DFE's role and responsibility in this as well I realize I've just broadened it out but I suppose what I'm saying is actually we need to do that on a regular basis it needs to be a regular um, pattern that we're looking at it Councillor Hibby mm. thank you for that firstly and um, based off the reviews you guys do internally with contracts like you said no contracts go out unless they're reviewed can we add the appraisal of Learn Sheffield or some of the work plan and the pointers we get from there to be part of the review of the contract. Yes, of course, Councillor. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, no, not that. Councillor Marshall. <laughs> yeah, um, just lastly, I think um, I echo uh, what I. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, in review uh, is good in terms of, I'm um, going back on, you know, when um, as councillors when we're actually <coughs> questioned in the public in in our wards as well I think that helps because um, yeah, what um, the impact uh, is um, learn direct having and also um, the part that the council plays as well so um, I like uh, how you've actually mentioned the regular um, review amongst uh, everybody then it, it shows that you know like um, we're not just delivering for the sake of it, we are actually monitoring and regularly reviewing stuff to make sure that uh, things are improved and also um, where gaps are, um, for example, how today was raised, where uh, those kind of uh, concerns and things uh, may not have to come here again because we, the earlier it's picked up, uh, the earlier it's addressed as well. So thank you. Thank you, councillors. So if I can just go back to the recommendations then. Are we proposing to agree these recommendations that as a committee, we will ensure that on the work programme that we do our job around the scrutiny of work that is commissioned? So not just around Learn Sheffield, actually, but other pieces of commissioned work that we will want to, because we don't have scrutiny anymore. The role of this committee is to scrutinise as well as be presented with information. So are we happy to agree these recommendations? However, take on the recommendations that, that, that within our work programme, we have regular uh, updates from Learn Sheffield and we discuss what those, with advice from officers, what those measures will be through our work programme. Paul. Thanks. Um, so I think for, for me, um, I'm halfway there with you. But I'm, I'm just uh, concerned because, I mean, you know, I don't know what the KPIs are or if there are any with this contract. It's been going for 20 years. We were told that yesterday, we were told that the contract used to be monitored, but it hasn't been for years. I won't say how many years because I'll probably remember it wrong anyway. Um, so what, at what point to say that we, we could, uh, we'll monitor the contract throughout the year anyway, like should have been happening. At what point, if if, uh, if that monitor monitoring reveals something that we a level of service that isn't satisfactory, what is what in numbers is that level of dissatisfaction required to cancel the contract after one year, and what what will we need to do to set something up, whether that be in sourcing? Or outsourcing to a different organisation, what what you know that needs that takes time as well, doesn't it? So there's no there's no much point. I'm I'm thinking of saying like, oh well, we've reviewed it in the autumn. There's problems. What are we going to do? Are we then committed to this to a to a contract that isn't working for Sheffield for two more years? I mean, we, we propose to write the contract to have a two-year basis, and there will be clauses within that, like any contract with a council entity, where if performance isn't adequate, that actually there will be clauses to enable the contract to um, end. I'm 
just going to look to Sarah in a minute because I think the issue that we got mm -hmm. is is that we th this contract that we're asking um, the committee's approval to to not for us to insource everything. It's a big. I'm talking in double negatives here. I apologise. Um, starts in September. So actually, when we review the impact of this contract, some of the activity is not till next summer. So, for example, uh, Councillor Turpin, obviously the oversight of 10% of schools doing Key Stage 2 SAP will be next May. Uh, and we'll be looking next after next May to work out what the impact of that has been. Likewise with Key Stage 1 moderation, that's in May going into June. So there'll be some things that we will be monitoring later on next year. But I think what would be useful for the committee to do would be to have a look at the contract where, where they've worked previously. Uh, and then, as uh, Council Bashrat would suggest, actually, then to create some lines of inquiry that could then be taken into the uh, contract re review uh, process. But again, to reassure you, if at any point we feel that the contract isn't being delivered, then there will be clauses within the contract that would enable us to end it. And going on to the running, if the moderation activity isn't until, until May or June, we would have until the following May or June to put that in place in the council. Although I'm saying to you at the moment we don't have that and we'd have to put that in place. Um, if we ended the contract after one year, we would then have a good lead in actually to be able to put that into place. So I hope that's a reassurance. Thank you. Councillor Mills and then Meredith. Yeah, um, just following on from that, I think you've answered some of my questions there. Um, what, what are we monitoring against? Uh, because that's if it's being monitored by officer, then you must be monitoring against something. And that's not what I'm, I'm not aware of it. I don't think anybody here is aware of what we're actually monitoring against. So that would be a key one for me to, to make base a judgment on. And I, and I, know, I know where Councillor Turpin is going as well, because it's been, it's been running for 20 odd years. It's just become norm and practice. Frivolously, I'm saying that, by the way. Uh, and when norm and practice kicks in, uh, it's, not, it's not a nice place to be. I'm glad this report actually came here even though it was, it was for a different purpose. Uh, but that's what we, we really need to do. So the second question I've got is, once we're into a two-year contract, this might be a, a procurement question, we won't have any opportunity to back out of it unless we've got something specifically written in there to say that you've not measured against the, uh, the, the KPIs for want of a better phrase. Uh, would we really? Uh, we'd be tied into a two-year contract, otherwise they'll ask for compensation. Although we have a share in this company as well, so we probably get something as well. <laughs> so indeed, we would be um, suing ourselves partially um, uh, for breach of contract, I guess, as part of that. So we do, with the council owns 19.9% in terms of the shares of its schools company, um, and the rest of the shares are owned by all the schools in Sheffield. So although I've described to you that 90% subscribe, that means they pay a subscription fee uh, to uh, to learn Sheffield, um, but actually all of them own the rest of the shares in uh, Learn Sheffield, regardless of whether they subscribe to that or can, not. Can I just clarify that Learn Sheffield is a company limited by guarantee, so it has no shares, no dividend is paid. <laughs> we don't get any money out of the company, uh, but we are a member of it, and as uh, as Andrew says, we have. Um, I think it's about 20% of the voting rights. The schools have the rest. But it, just to clarify, it's not a company limited by shares, so it's not. There's no payment out on those shares or or any dividend payable. Thank you. I don't Thank think I said it was on a shareholding, but nevertheless, if I did, I apologise uh, for for anything that was misleading. So, um, I you're right that if we were to end a contract arbitrarily. And without grounds, you know, there could, that could create uh, liabilities for us. But I think that's the point. We would create some KPIs around the uh, the areas of activity we wish to contract with them, and then we would contract management, contract manage against them. The the learning shift has been around for eight years, so it's uh, it, this is now it comes to the end of its eight year uh, of commission from the council, deliberately set up by the council as a schools company in partnership with schools. It has tackle exemptions which means it's not actually subject to uh, the full procurement uh, processes of the council because we partly own that um, um, as well as part of that um, and that also gives us some leverage i think in terms of uh, contract management um, as well contract management difficulties 
arose specifically during the pandemic because actually Lane Sheffield wasn't able to actually deliver um, all of the, the contracts that like other contract other private providers that were in receipt of contracts from public bodies during the pandemic we were asked and required to actually con honor the contracts with them but that's really where the contract management uh, uh, was less by that sorry i'm going to bring uh, meredith in and then council horner but i'm uh, council here and then i'm gonna to have to draw a line under this because mindful of time i'm gonna to have to ask us to extend the meeting so, until quarter two but we've got two more agenda items to go through um, in this meeting. Uh, it's not Meredith. I'll be very fast. Um, so coming into Sheffield, I think it is a real uh, bonus that there is an organisation like Learn Sheffield where 90% of schools are part of that and we can have that single conversation. Um, I, I, understand, I think that absolutely we need to have that ability to look at what we are um, funding for that, but I think it is something which actually shows that you should be really proud of that um, schools are coming together and working in that way within Learn Sheffield. Thank you, Councillor Horner. Yeah, I think we're, we're sort of dancing around this. What, 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 <clears throat> I don't want an answer now, but I think we need a, a, some briefing or paper or whatever to tell us what, what, the, what the measures are, you know, what the KPIs are, as, Cam, as Councillor Turpin said earlier. So I don't, I don't want to extend it too long now. But I think in, in, in the coming days, we need to know what those measures are, because we're talking about uh, reviewing this, looking at it, but we don't know what it is we're asking to be, to be looking at. And that's, that's ridiculous. And I'm left feeling slightly stupid, which um, I have no problem with, with, with somebody saying to me, you're actually stupid, Councillor Horner. But in this case, um, I, have, I have no idea what, it, what the measurements might be, and that's what we need to know. I think that would set everybody's mind at rest, or, or it would provoke uh, questions from us in a future meeting, well, actually, why these KPIs and not, not others, uh, particularly given the, the conversation we started the day with. Um, uh, and so I think we just need somebody to tell us at some point, not now, but to give us clearly what, what it is, what the measurements are, uh, and, and what might trigger various sets of actions, because we just need to be confident of that, um, that, that you know, we're not just talking about well, we'll give somebody a contract and then we'll think about what it is. It's like me saying to somebody, you know, cut the grass. And by the way, um, you didn't cut that bit of grass. Well, you didn't ask me to. You know, uh, that's, the, that's the question. Okay, thank you for that. I agree. And as uh, Andrew has said, this, this will come back and we do need to follow it up uh, as a committee regarding what is being measured. Okay, Councillor Haber, I'll bring you in. I'll let Andrew come in. So just specifically on that point, mm -hmm. Councillor Holland, we, we're here seeking permission from the committee not to ensource these activities and once that decision is taken we will then go to draw up a contract which will include um, relevant kpis but i'll just repeat the activity that we're actually asking learn sheffield to do now is relatively simple and focused on four um four areas um in relation to support during ofsted inspections support during head teacher appointments key stage one uh, right to moderation key stage two um, uh, um, uh, appropriateness of, of SATs uh, tests so for example I don't want to make up KPIs on the spot but actually the key stage one moderation would be that a KPI for that would be one that it had taken place two to included 25% of schools and that actually three that the levels of moderation were appropriate so it's I think we just need to temper expectations about the very limited contract that we're going to offer in terms of KPIs. How we then look at broader outcomes, I think definitely in terms of the point that Meredith made, we would want to make sure that that forms part of the cycle of the committee. Thank you. One last question from Councillor Haby, and then that's it on this. Thank you. Um, most of what I was going to say was said um, earlier. Um, however, KPI is the most important thing. For example, on the answer we gave to the the people that came in earlier, we said we are looking over the next year to work with schools and in partnership with Learn Sheffield. To sorry, can you there. speak into your microphone? Sorry. So part of the, I guess you could say, the answers that was given to the people that came with their questions was that Learn Sheffield will look to increase diversity in governing boards to represent the communities and pupils they serve. Is that an existing KPI? If it isn't, it's things like it, that we want on as KPIs. So for me, I don't think I can vote for something now for two years without actually having a full conversation about the KPIs. 
just to clarify, Chair, that some of the um, work that you talked in your answers and Mary just talked about is about working with Learn Sheffield, but some of those aspects you talked about, for example, around governor support, are not things that we purchase from Learn Sheffield. They are part of the services schools purchase directly from Learn Sheffield. So KPIs about those wouldn't be in this contract that we're talking about now. That doesn't mean that we can't do those things that, that, that you talked about um, with the young people and, and do that. And it doesn't mean that you can't look at changes going forward and things you might want to put in place. But the specific services that the officers are talking about now is those very specific services that we've talked about, about statutory school improvement, um, offset, that sort of thing. So things like the governor support and working with them on governors isn't part of this contract. Can we make it part of the contract? We can't um, because this is specifically about specific areas. So it's about things like um, potential moderation of exams, that kind of thing. However, the point that you're making is absolutely the right one. How are we going to monitor that Learn Sheffield and schools are undertaking that quality diversity work? And I think that that's the um, race equality priority that we'll work on as a committee and making sure that's right. And actually, it's about inviting the Chief Exec of Learn Sheffield here to talk to him, I think it's him, um, about um, uh, the, the role that he plays in leading that as well, as well as all of us being leaders. So the answer is yes, we need to do that, but it's not through this that we do it. No, no, thank you, I appreciate that. There's one thing I've learned in my long life, that to take things seriously, you have to tie it to an income source or money, or else people will dance around it. So if it wasn't a contract, it's almost formally there for people to take something serious, or else, you know, you can get words and letters sent. But if it's tied to a contract, that's when it's most likely to, you know, make an impact. So if we're serious about diversity and, you know, the things we mentioned previous, you're saying there's zero way of pulling that in the contract as a KPI. If, if I could just come back in on that, while I, while I fully agree, and I know what motivates people, and that generally is cash. However, part of the Race Equality Commission was about partners signing up to, the, to doing their part of delivery of this commission, and Learn Sheffield were one of those stakeholders. So while this is not about the council having a financial responsibility for that, this is about other stakeholders across Sheffield, whether that be the NHS, South Yorkshire Police, Learn Sheffield, schools, doing their bit and our responsibility as the council is to ensure that as the as the custodian of the commission is to ensure that they are doing that clearly today it was evident that this work isn't being done but i think today we're not being asked to put that into this contract we're not actually being really asked very much about the contract we're being asked to agree not to insource the service and i think we're kind of muddy we're graying the areas slightly, but I think the Race Equality Commission was not about offering anyone any money to do anything any different. It was about people making a commitment to delivering, and I think that is what we will have to facilitate and broker and push with Learn Sheffield, unfortunately. But we will do it, because that's the commitment that we've made today. Oh, thank you. I'm not going to push on this. We just need to agree to extend the meeting. Well, I was going to, at half past, I was going to set up quarter two, but that only gives us about three minutes. So until, pardon? Yeah. <laughs> We've got to uh, uh, agree this recommendation. We have two other agenda items, which officers, yeah, but officers have been sat waiting all day. So if I could extend the meeting to five o'clock, uh, are we all all right with that? Okay. So um, nobody disagreed. It sounds like no, I think that you did agree with me. Yeah, I'm just asking you whether we haven't voted on this yet. I'm just asking you if you agree uh, to extend the meeting. Thank you. Okay, so back to the recommendations with the information which we now have. Are we uh, in agreement with the recommendations, but with a caveat that we will work on the other elements uh, to around scrutiny and the race equality piece of work as well through the work programme and this committee? If I could see a show of hands that we agree that. Thank you. Is anybody abstaining? Two abstentions. Can we close those? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, the next item on the agenda is the annual update of the Building Successful Families programme.
um, followed by the financial outrun. Um, sorry you've been waiting so long and you've got such a short space of time for such an important uh, piece of work. I do apologise for that. But we could always invite you back again or we could have a, a separate meeting on this if officers so wish and well, members. Uh, but yeah, if you'd like to introduce yourself. So I'm Marie McGreevy, Strategic Commissioning Manager for Early Years and Early Health and CMLA. And I'm a Commission Officer for Early Years and Early Health, but I focus primarily on early help. So this is going to be part of a regular cycle of bringing an update on the Building Successful Families programme um, to committee. Um, it will probably usually be earlier in the year. I think we just needed to get going with the committees to find out when we needed to do that. And in future, it will also provide a plan for the following year as well. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Helen now. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the Building Successful Families Programme, or what you may hear is referred to as BSF within Sheffield, is part of the larger National Supporting Families Programme. That was launched in 2012. Um, under the name Troubled Families, hence why each local authority give it a different name. In 2018, we were awarded something called earned autonomy status, and having that earned autonomy, earned autonomy status meant that we, we could evidence high levels of maturity across our wider early health system, as well as with our data um, maturity elements as well. That means that we um, receive upfront funding from the national team at the start of each financial year, and it also means that we don't have as many audit checks by the national team because we have proven our level of maturity. The programme has recently been commissioned um, for 2022 to 2025 by the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. And with that new commission came um, a host of new outcomes framework that the national team expected us to implement by October 3rd. That was a massive piece of work um, including a variety of people from data teams all the way through to frontline workers to ensure that we had that implementation effectively. And it, it was implemented on October 3rd, which is a, a massive achievement for the city. Um, they also launched an early health system guide self-assessment. So it's a very detailed document highlighting areas around, around five key descriptors of what they see as the national vision of early health. So it covers family voice and experience, workforce, communities, leadership, and data. And within that, you have to score and create um, an overarching position of what you see as working well within the city and also what we aim to prioritize over the coming year. That then formed the basis of our assurance visit that we held in um, August last year at the town hall. And we had colleagues come from the Department for Level Up Housing and Communities, Department for Work and Pensions, and DFE, scrutinizing what we had put in that document. As part of that document, we also had to identify three priority areas. So they were the implementation of information sharing data governance board, the implementation of a strategic early help board across the city, and also preparing a, um, a framework for professionals that would support that work alongside the wider communities. Um, really pleased to say that all three of those priority areas were met and we received Again, really, really positive feedback from the national team and colleagues from that assurance visit. And the main point from that is that we retained earned autonomy status until 2025. We have been working hard to raise the profile across the last 12 to 18 months of the Building Successful Families programme in Sheffield. Having earned autonomy status, we are only one of 14 local authorities. I think that is now one of 15. Um, as there was an additional one added last year, but that's out of all the local authorities in England and Wales, which is a, a great achievement for the city. And what that means is we wanted to be up there and part of talking about the good practice that we do in this city, showcasing all the work with, that we do, the co-production with communities, stakeholders, everybody, and really entrenching that culture of early help is not one service, one person, it is a system of everything. And one of our VCF partners at the um, Early Help System Guide workshop that we held, that we held to really co-produce this self-assessment stated, it's not just about early help, people talk about early help and the front door for services. Often within communities, we are the garden gate and that's really stuck and we've took that back to national meetings that they are there when families don't even know what they might need or what they could access. And all of this work that we are doing, so we've been invited down to national um, conferences in London to talk about the success of our early help. 
partnership work and we've created webinars, blogs, um, different resources for the national team. We lead on good peer reviews. Um, it, has, it has really developed sort of the national team's um, understanding of what good practice is taking place. Over the last few months, we have been creating the updated version of the early health system guide. So that's currently with um, colleagues to approve sign off and then we will share with the councillors and elected members. Um, and as part of that, again, we held two workshops, one in February and one in May to co-produce that with 50 attendees from each. I think you do actually have on the third or fourth page of your um, booklet, the, the list of partners that attended last year's and it was very similar to this year's. One of the things that we do, really do want to do moving forward is really drive and increase that understanding and awareness of what early health is for children, people and families across the city, engage as many services as we can to really drive home again that culture of early help across everybody's responsibility. We are intrinsically linked to the family hubs. Um, you'll see that I've got a family hub lanyard on. We are developing and pooling resources to ensure that actually what we are doing benefits both programmes and we are not duplicating workload. We're not wasting time of members and of um, partner services. They hear something once, they hear the right message and it comes from all of us as, a, as um, this, we're singing from the same hymn sheet um, essentially. And just all of those programmes coming together is, is being a massive turn point for, for both of them because we have such big frameworks for both and I think one of the final points I want to make is that we've recently had confirmation that the National Supporting Families Programme will be moving from um, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities to the Department for Education in April 2024 which is where also the, the family hubs sit and that Start for Life trailblazer element. So that's where we're looking at at the minute and that's the overview of the last 12 months. Just to add, I know we were talking about family hubs earlier and how that links into this, this group. We are, as Emily says, intrinsically linked. There is an expectation on us as an earned autonomy area that we are joining up our transformation activity. Um, the early hub strategy will be coming to this committee in September. Early family hubs are part of that strategy as, it, as a supporting family. So it is all linked together, essentially. Um, take on board what uh, you've said to us previously, Councillor Gale, around making sure that members are involved in the development of the early hub system guide, and we'll certainly do that going forward. Um, <coughs> and yet the biggest step forward for us going for the next year is the push around increased voluntary and community involvement um, in both supporting families and family hubs. Thank you. Just be mindful of time, members. I am sorry to rush you, but has anybody got any comments or quick questions on this? Just a, a quick um, comment. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to definitely read up more about it, but I love that you've actually uh, mentioned, you know, working with communities and stakeholders and involving them because obviously that is the grassroots um, way of putting things in. So well done. Um, for all the hard work, but I will uh, read more because I don't know much. Paul. Oh, I'll just pretend to be Mark then. Uh, so, so just one super short comment. It was just really nice to, to um, see you present that and a big smile on your face and really happy with the work and you're right to be happy because it's excellent, you know, and and I, I love it when we hear about Sheffield and the, the council being near the top of a table for the right reasons. It's really good, really positive, and also really good to hear as well about your constant evolution and, and exploring uh, new and better ways. I don't have a question. I just thought wanted to give you my appreciation, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so this paper is just for noting, and um, again, thank you for all the work that you've been doing. What I will propose is that as part of the member induction, uh, into this committee, um, this will be part of that agenda uh, because I think it is, as elected members in communities where this work is being delivered, I think it's really important that we're aware of all that's on offer across Sheffield. Um, and I really don't think you'll have an issue uh, engaging with voluntary and community sector because they're out there doing it anyway. And I think they'll just be, they'll just kind of snap your hand off. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for all the work that you're doing and thank you for bringing this report. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Whatever we can do as part of the induction, we're more than happy to get involved in. <laughs> Great, thank you.
Okay, so the final item on our agenda is item number 11 on page 93, which is the 2022-23 financial outrun. And I believe we've got Jane Ruby here. Thank you for waiting, Jane. <laughs> Okay, Jane, would you like to uh, give us your report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it brief so I know we've not got long. Um, so my name's Jane Wilby. I'm Head of Accounting. Don't see where my name tag is, but never mind. Uh, the purpose of the report is to bring the committee up to date with the Council's General Fund outturn position for 22-23, since the final position has reclosed. So the full report was presented to the Finance Committee last week and then each of the individual policy committees have got a summarised version um, to have a look through. So a lot of you may have seen the other committees because I've been at basically the wall delivering the same information uh, very recently. The outturn paper supports our annual statement of accounts which will be presented to the Audit and Standards Committee tomorrow. Um, it's worth noting that the, um, we, have been, we have managed to hit statutory deadlines for the 31st of May in our statutory accounts, which is quite a significant achievement given the uh, deadlines being brought forward a couple of months. So in terms of the outturn, um, the, the general fund did overspend by 5 million against a net revenue budget of 450 million last year, which meant that we had an unplanned draw from reserves to meet the in-year deficit. In 21-22, we'd identified a £70 million risk reserve to manage to uh, help us deliver our budgets. So in 21-22, we used £20 million of that to cover the overspend in year. When we set the budget in 22-23, we used £15 million of it. So last year, the draw from reserves was really more like another £20 million if we're accounting for that £5 million overspend. So that leaves us £30 million as we move into 23-24. And we do have a lot of challenges in, in order to deliver our budgets this year. So the closing position did improve um, throughout the year. So we did start reporting a position of overspend of about 20 million during the first part of the year. And we reduced that down to 5 million. There is a table in the pack that talks about the uh, improvement and which committee's budgets contributed towards the improvement throughout the year. In adult social care, we had an improvement of 6 million. And that was due to um, additional funding that we'd received from the winter discharge funding. Um, in the strategy and resources budget, we saw additional income in through investments. We had favourable interest rates above what we budgeted for. And we also had additional uh, income from the business rate levy surplus. So um, the main committee overspends were uh, 5.7 million in adults, 5.8 in children's, and we also had issues in our housing revenue account as well. So we had a lot of issues to do with the backlog in repairs in the year. Um, a loss of rents from vacant properties. So specifically in the children's committee then, so in section 1.4 talks a little bit more about this committee budget in more detail. Um, the education children and families overspent by 5.8 million against a net budget of 128 million. The challenges really were about delivering those budget savings that were set out in 22-23. So there was a 2.7 million pounds um, savings um, a, a couple of savings combined that um, related to the children's residential strategy. So um, there was, there's been issues in that throughout the year. We've also had a shortfall in income in our secure residential unit, Aldine House, due to some staffing issues there. Um, we'd also missed the budget saving of 1.4 million, which was due. Um, we, we'd anticipated additional income from health partners this year. So I think it's worth noting to the committee there is a risk to budgets as we move into 23-24 as so far no proposals have been put in place that would need to underpin any joint commission and agreements in the future. Um, we've also had issues in the placement costs that have contributed towards the overspend. So the recommendation for this paper is really just to note the financial position for 22-23 for the council and for the committee and to just make you aware that the next committee update will be in September where we'll be um, taking you through the 23-24 outturn position for the quarter one results. Um, Councillor Dale, I think, has suggested that we also have a knowledge brief perhaps sometime over the summer to give you a little bit more information on finances in general to help you get a little more comfortable with the committee budget so we can work with colleagues to arrange that. Happy to take any questions. 
Thank you. Yeah, we did recommend that because we tend to focus on a budget when we're setting the next budget and we really need to be aware of the current budget and ensuring that we're mitigating any bumps in the road and that we have a plan to be able to do that. But the fact of the matter is there just isn't enough money for the services of Sheffield that we want to deliver for our young people. So, you know, we will do everything that we can to come within budget, but we do have to be really clear that we need more money for our children in Sheffield. We need more money to look after our looked after children. We need more money in education. We need more, definitely need more money in early years because that's where we need to underpin the work that we are doing as a city for, for our children and their families and the future of the city. So whilst you do everything that you can as a team, what I would like to do is I'd like to thank all of the officers last year for getting us through the, through the, the budget process uh, in a way where we were looking at overspending a lot more than we were and a lot of work with the previous members of this committee and the officers a lot of work really did go on to be able to bring us in at that 5.8 rather than 12 million pound overspend so thank you everyone for that has anyone else uh, Shona did you want to make a comment please thank you I, I did because I think it you know truthfully it's quite hard to note quite a big overspend um, and we know why it's happened and all the things that you've said about underfunding absolutely hold. But at the same time, we did have a plan, and that plan didn't work. Um, so I think the notion that we'd get more income from Aldine House, um, and the fact that one of our underspends is because we didn't recruit fieldwork staff, which I can only assume had then uh, an impact on, on the rest of our work. So what are the proposals this year to attempt to claw back, bearing in mind all those things that we've said about the fact that we've just got not enough funding anyway, but at the same time we are expected to balance our budgets each year, which again is, I, I would suggest it's an impossibility and the government never does. Um, how, how we're actually going to get through this because this, this is a huge amount of money to, ha you know, if we're saying, oh, we'll have to take it out of reserves, our reserves are so woeful now that that's not really an option. Um, and I think we ought to be worried about all this. Hey, thank you for your comment. Um, completely agree and I think that that's something that we it's yes it's to note um, but I think that we can't we can't continue dipping into reserves to cover a year deficits and the focus from services really needs to be on how we do deliver those in year savings plans and savings proposals so yes we've there was a you know a very long process last year to go through what was feasible what's realistic and I think this year so far we've been working with services to make sure that we're monitoring and we're sort of recording and forecasting where we're going to land with those different um, elements of savings packages alongside budgets. We talked a little bit about staffing and that was underspent in certain areas. So there's a lot of work again to understand what that establishment structure should look like and what it does look like so that when we are monitoring those overspends and underspends we can be real, we have some assurance around the quality of that budget in the first place so that we know that we, you know, we're focusing our attention on the right areas. Um, there has been a big focus this year to make sure that we are keeping on track with that, those savings delivery um, and keeping those, uh, keeping the directors of uh, service directors and heads of service held to account really um, for the, you know, making sure that we are delivering what we said we're going to deliver because the sort of level of achieved savings that we've had in the past over the past couple of years is, has not been acceptable and we need to be aiming for a, a better um, performance really in terms of the level of savings that we're actually achieving and actually delivering uh, so that the budgeting process is not actually just a paper exercise it you know and I think the fact that we did this with committees last year and there was a lot of engagement with committees last year um, I think you know there's more ownership of what those budgets and what those savings are so yeah we, we are seeing you know a we're hoping to, to get a bit more traction on that as well. So we'll be able to report to you um, what the actual position is in, in the next next uh, couple of months. Thank you. Any more comments or questions from you? Thank you for coming, Jane. That brings us to the end of our meeting. I would like to thank everyone um, for your commitment today. And I think that this committee is going to be 
um, a very hard-working one. We've got very engaged members, which is really good, because the last thing you want to do is sit in a committee meeting with members that are not interested in the topics that we're talking about. And it's really clear that the members we've got on this committee this time around, was, and as was last time, but it is really, really evident that we're going to get a lot of work done this year. So, yeah, thank you, everyone, and thank you to officers uh, for all of your reports and all that you work that you've put in today. Thank you.